Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and the window is open. There's a chill in the air, and here we are with Jim Cornette's drive through right here. It is spring, although not everywhere is feeling that today. But we're going to have a great show, talking about the usual crap. I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and here he is, the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. It's 80-something degrees here today, Brian. Is it is it chilly up there where you are? It's like 49 and drizzling. Well, it's the drizzling, all right. I've been there. But nevertheless, I ju- you, you just jumped right into the open. You just jumped right into my introduction. I hate it when people are so aggressive right off the bat. Like you, It's supposed to be a, a calm, civil procedure at the start, and then we'll work up to it. Instead, you, you're coming at me like Stephen P. New in an open courtroom with people under oath, for heaven's sake. Calm that tone down. Don't make me change my tone. Well, anecdotally, I was just trying to have a good time here with you. And, of course, good luck with that. We're talking about wrestling. Yes. Our favorite thing. Hit the thing but we before loathe. we do that, before we do that. <laughs> no, I got it. I told you before we went on the air, I'm going to give you a programming note here. I saw a television program that I bet you didn't see that everybody out there should have saw. If you only saw what I heard. Um, it, and I guess it's been almost a week ago now, or what? Maybe it has been a week. But Billy Joel, his one hundredth consecutive sellout performance at Madison Square Garden was on network television. I believe it was the ABC. And boy, howdy! What a fucking sh- how old is Billy Joel? Start working on that if that takes you a second, because I'll tell you. You know, the problem is when you go back and you, you, you know, see some of your stars, your idols, your rock heroes from the 60s, 70s, even the 80s on stage now, they're, they're still out there. Some of them can get away with it. Elton John sounds nothing like he used to whatsoever, but he, he's figured out a way to make it work. I he's very smart. Mick Jagger doesn't have fucking... He's, he could sing, blow me, blow me, blow me, blow me. It doesn't matter. He's just out there being Mick. At 80, that he can be Mick is amazing. I think they gave him a body transplant. Same surgeon that did Shapoopy's brain. But if some people, like, have you seen Roger Daltrey? He needs to just give it up. Oh, stop it. Oh, come just on. Just give it up. What? And, and well, because it... <laughs> There's a lot of people out there still trying to sound like they did then, and they can't. And with the groups, and the, the Eagles pulled it off, but they weren't really high energy like goddamn, you know, fucking Robert Plant or anything to begin with. But you're speaking specifically about sound, because Roger Dolce looks good for his age, but... No, I'm not saying, no, everybody looks good for their age, because the, the option is, other way is death, so yeah. But but the point being, no, sounding like being able to to live up to the performance of your youth, hence why certain people, after they get to a certain age, don't do that shit anymore. Because you don't want to go out there and just lay it. Have you seen KC of the Sunshine Band lately? Have you seen KC and the Sunshine Band in the last three or four years? I've, I've, a YouTube video popped up the other day. What are you going to say? That's not really my scene. I really didn't see them no, recently but no. or in the past or ever. No, but this is just a, a fucking experiment in goddamn some kind of sociopathic human nature or something. Yeah, that YouTube recommended them in your algorithm. What no, that no, because, well, here's the thing. Do a little Classic. dance, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I want to put on my boogie shoes. No, it didn't sound like that. <laughs> ding, 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 keep it coming. But the point is, here was a guy that had multiple platinum fucking hits, right? In a, I mean, Casey and Sunshine, well, you weren't born then, but everywhere on the radio. Multiplat, look it up, Google him, kids. If you don't believe me, this motherfucker so bored, goddamn records in 1975 than Elvis and the Beatles combined from Miami, right? From my, the Miami fucking sound. And he started TK records. He started out as a, uh, as an office boy hanging around, looking to be able to record in off hours when nobody was looking. But anyway, the point is Italy, he's trim. He's slim. He looks, he's got the fucking horn section. You know, it's, it's just lovely for the time. 
Now he's doing county fairs and 4-H fucking shows, and he weighs like 325 fucking pounds. And he's sweating like a whore in church, and he's goddamn, he can't even remember the fucking words and makes fun of it on stage because, or, or does not have the oxygen to emit those words from his bloated fucking carcass anymore. And that's where you say, okay, he must need the money because why would else would you subject yourself to public ridicule? But I was talking about Billy Joel, wasn't I? Yeah, then you went down that road. Well, but how old is Billy Joel? 74. 70 fucking four years. He's better now than he was 30 years ago. He's he's almost bald and he's got the... the no, he's the, bald. Well, he's, he's got a little stubble on the back. And he had the gray chin whiskers, but otherwise he sounds. <laughs> but he's, otherwise he's bald. Well, but no, but otherwise he's, he's he looks great. He's he's energetic. He's as good a singer as he was thirty years ago, and he's a better pianist because now he's had thirty more years of fucking practice, and he's a goddamn art. Before he was piano man, now he's goddamn Liberace motherfucker. But this was, and it was on network television so they had commercials and i'll i'll tell you a funny side story i didn't aew this because when i heard about it i hit the dvr i said i don't know if this is live or not and i don't want to miss anything so i'm gonna record the local news that comes on afterward just to make sure it doesn't run over because certainly they won't cut billy joel off right but it turns out it wasn't live but they apparently had a live sporting event that took up like an extra half hour and it bumped the network schedule back so when i hit the the the, the dvr of the show and i've got some complete other program I, what the fuck they're fucking me out of belly right and i fast forward through 30 fucking minutes and finally it comes off so apparently it was bumped to 9 30 but i had the local news and so i got everything but the last like two minutes of this fucking show but even with commercials, he goddamn, he's got energy. And the focus is on him most of the time. They do the little tricks where they have a couple of his band people come out and do a solo of some description or sing a song or whatever to give him a little chance to breathe because you know this is going on live at, at the Garden. I'm surprised you've never been to see Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden with you being a confirmed goddamn Yankee. He is a Long Island icon. You know, growing up on Long Island, you never knew if it was going to be your house he drove into. <laughs> or the tree in front of your house that he drove into. <laughs> but no, I'm a big Billy Joel fan. I grew up and actually, he had a house down the street from my grandparents in Florida for a while. Uh, him and Christy Brinkley in the 80s. And uh, I like Billy Joel. And Well, that, that's why I'm saying it. And it also isn't But I hate going to the garden. But I hate going into Manhattan. I hate going into the garden. And to me... Having gone to as many concerts and been involved in as many live events as I have, I rather, if I'm going to see a band, I'd rather go to a small venue. I don't enjoy myself in like an MSG-like setting. Well, see, now now you're talking sense because I always hated the goddamn place to begin with and don't want to be in a crowd, but I figured that you being from up there, that that was part of the thing. Every year you get your uh, car license renewal and driver's license renewal in the mail. And then you're fucking noticed to go see Billy Joel at Madison square garden. Cause that's part of being a goddamn card carrying New York. It'd be like a Kentucky Colonel that didn't want to eat fried chicken. You know, I said to myself, I said, you know, if I wait long enough, this will be on TV somehow. Well, and then you missed it. I didn't miss so it. It's on again this week. Cause well, I know why you, I'll let you reveal it to the audience. Well, I don't know why. I didn't know it was on again this week. Oh, yeah, it's on again because it was such a controversy because they cut off the ending. Well, I thought they, I thought my DVR cut off the ending because they were 30 minutes late to begin with. Did they cut off the goddamn ending of the after they delayed it 30 minutes? CBS cut off the ending. What the... <laughs> how? The, it, what is this, the fucking Heidi game? What? How do you... How does a network... In this day and age, with all the bells and whistles and safeguards, how do they cut off their goddamn major programming like their AEW? Jim, I have an article here from People Magazine, your favorite, by Sabiana Bowman. CBS apologizes after Billy Joel's CBS concert cut short. Here's what happened. 
CBS didn't appear to be in the mood for a melody on Sunday, April 14th. <laughs> what a nice way to write. <laughs> Near the end of the highly anticipated special, The 100th, Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden, the greatest arena run of all time, not counting Jim Londis, the network abruptly cut away to local news as Billy Joel was singing the final chorus of this iconic piano man. Yes, that's that's where I'm okay. My goddamn DVR froze. Apparently they did too. That is like, of all of his songs, the one that the audience would sing along with the most. Yes. Imagine you're singing along with it. It just yes. cuts off to the news. And suddenly it's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Yeah, they're at the Billy Joel concert, motherfucker. Uh, let me scroll down because I don't need to read Twitter thoughts of random people. As for why the special was cut short, the answer is simple. The concert had a late start time. CBS aired the 2024 Masters Tournament earlier there you in the have evening. Fucking golfers, golfing mother white old fucking rich entitled motherfuckers taking up too much goddamn space that could be used to fucking house the goddamn homeless on their fucking golf courses. Rich pricks. And when it ran over, it pushed the start of Joel's concert back by 30 minutes. This in turn Boom. led CBS to cut away to local news as the broadcast spilled over into the 11 o'clock time slot. <sighs> Good news! CBS has apologized for the snafu and will be airing the 100th Billy Joel Live at Madison Square Garden in full April 19th at 9 p.m. So tomorrow night as we are recording at 9 p.m. Oh, right, well, God damn, hold on. Let me get a piece of... I'm going to write this down now. Oh, I was hoping we'd actually get to hear your program your DVR. Are you kidding? My DVR is fucking on the bottom floor. You don't have like one that like, links to all the different TVs in the house? Do they do that? Yeah. Well, I don't want it. Some Somebody in the other room telling me what I'm fucking doing. Here, I'm just... Uh, watch <laughs> Billy. This is an exciting show so far. Yeah, hold on. Watch Billy. What'd you say? Nine o'clock? Nine o'clock on CBS. C it was CBS then. It wasn't the ABC. CBS. Well, fuck them and their fucking golfers. The All Tiffany right, that, and it's Friday night. That's right. Well, uh, now, there you go. Rampage is fucked, because they're, they're not going to... You can't compete with Billy. Play me a song, you're the piano man. Sing me a song. Play me, sing me, do me any of the songs. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I'm going to put this note he, over. Um, you know, he, he got really big also with MTV in like 83, 84. Were you listening to him on the road at all? Yes, because he was all, you couldn't turn on the radio because that's what we had back in those days, kids, the radio in the car. That's what we listened to or the tape player in the car because that was, there only two choices. Um, and you couldn't go fucking 20 minutes without hearing Billy Joel because whatever was hot on MTV, they played on the radio. But the point is with, I mean, he couldn't even begin in, in an hour and a half plus commercials. He couldn't possibly do all the hits and we did not hear, we, we didn't start the fire because I don't think they wanted to start the goddamn fibra defibrillator for poor Billy at this is 74 years old. But goddamn, anyway, he was fucking great. He took rests in the right places, and what a production. The stage is in the middle. It's not at the end with seats blocked off. It's at the it's on the floor, but at the end. So you can imagine the garden. Every permanent seat is full, and then a bunch of seats on the floor. And they shot this thing. They might even be able to teach our new folks over at WWE a few things about crowd shots and pans because it was it was awesome. So now, by the time that fucking people hear this, it'll have been played over again. So, but catch it streaming somewhere out. Uh, tap into a goddamn phone. Climb a telephone pole. Tap into one of the lines. Probably not the power line, but whatever line looks like you can tap into, folks, and see if you can downstream it i don't think that's how it works are there any other musical acts that you would actually want to see live at this point um <laughs> there are some like i saw the avid brothers a few years ago here in louisville obviously pre-pandemic because i was still in a crowded atmosphere uh but uh as as a guest of dolph ramser they're you know dolph their manager guy. and tremendous guy producer and i don't know what all of his uh, record company executive, what his various titles are, but he, the Avis manager are, of the yeah. Avis brothers. There you go. And he's got his own record company and he does other things. Ramsor records. He's a 
He's a goddamn renaissance man. So anyway, he had me down to the Louisville Palace, and that was awesome. I really enjoyed that. But I don't... To be honest, to to go through the actual procedure, if you're just going as a regular ticket purchasing patron, by the time you park and walk and fucking sit there and the seat's 18 inches and my ass is still 20 these days, because I do have a little spread when I sit. There is a little fucking vertical movement. Or is that horizontal? I'm not sure. It, it jiggles up and down. Uh, but uh, you're sit, and then you got to stand up because everybody else going to stand up. If you're anywhere near the fucking stage on the floor, if you're up, then you're fucking, you know, you're seeing, you're watching the fucking screen. Well, I can watch TV and on a goddamn eighty-two inch, be closer to it, and I can pause it to go to the kitchen, that type of thing. And then you got to repeat the procedure to leave. Eh, eh, and then you don't know who's breathing on you. So I prefer it when I it, when I'm somehow a guest of the proceedings or the 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 performers or whatever. Like you know, I got to see ZZ Top sitting on the side of a fuck of the stage on an anvil case the whole night while and using the locker room bathrooms that type of thing. I enjoyed that, but I wouldn't want to been sitting up in the back row of the Coliseum. I just saw the documentary. If you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. It's pretty cool the behind the scenes, the making of we are the world and just how Lionel Richie and Quincy Jones pulled the whole thing together. I have seen, I have seen a documentary. I don't know if it's the same one. Cause it, it's been a while. Is this brand new, new or is it, it's brand? Well then I've seen another one, but yeah, go ahead. It's on Netflix. Have Stacy show with you because they show the whole group at the beginning of the night when they finally get everyone there together after the American music awards, practicing, singing the chorus. And then there's a lot going on. Al Jarreau got blind drunk, <laughs> which is something they never, you never realize watching the video, but now you can't see it the same way. Drunk, he's dancing. He starts everyone singing Deo to Bella Fonte. <laughs> all that's going on, but Stevie Wonder suggests, why don't we all sing something in Swahili? And before they realize, Stevie, the people we're singing about don't speak Swahili. Waylon Jennings is like, I've had enough, and just walked out of the... You see him on camera, just walk out of the bleachers with everyone and just leave the room. <laughs> I thought of Waylon Jennings because of the Great American Bash, because of you seeing live music at shows. That's how it works. Well, there you go. But it's your show, and it was Billy's show, and you're going to show it again, but the people have missed it again, but it was a great show. A really big show. A show that we can all aspire to see one day. But he ain't getting any younger, so hurry, folks, while you still can. A hundred MSGs in a row. And that that's probably not going to happen anytime ever again, right? Because poor, oh, poor Bruno. Bruno. What about Bruno? What about poor, me? Bruno, what, poor Bruno didn't have a hundred in a row. I'm sorry. I don't, you know. It was a hundred sellouts. And no, it was supposed, wasn't it supposed to be? You know how they did that formula, don't you? Because he admitted it later on when they did the research, but that didn't get as much. Uh, people still... I didn't know there was a formula. I mean, I know they made up the number. Not, not that Bruno wasn't a wild success, and eventually, especially in Ernest's second yeah. run, you know, the garden was on fire in the 70s, but he didn't have anywhere near the amount of sellouts that he says he did. Well, yeah, but uh, how, the, how they figured it out, first of all, and when he found out it didn't get as much publicity that he did say, well, okay, you know, he admitted that, okay, if they have the, you know, records, but... That Don Gorilla Monsoon got me again. No, 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 it was George Ann. Oh. You know this, don't you? Well, George Ann did the record book, I know that. Well, no, no, but there was actually a guy named Fred Hornby. Yeah. That did a Bruno record book. Uh, well, he did the Buddy that, Rogers. I thought he did Bruno, too. Uh, I don't know if he did Bruno Fred. The big thing Fred Hornby did, he did a Buddy Rogers record book, and it was in multiple parts. And then sadly, I believe, when Fred Hornby died, all of his files went to the Wrestling Hall of Fame in Texas. Uh, so they've been rescued maybe somewhere, but if they're with any of the Wrestling Halls of Fame, I hope someone rescues him. I don't trust any of these people with their Halls of Fame. Well, now, come on, let's not paint everybody with the same brush. Anyway, we've got sideways off the story. Same brush. Years ago, Bruno sat down with Georgianne Macropolis, who was his fan club president, because they wanted to try to figure it out, because that's before anybody had done any of this research. And 
while reports of all these various shows were floating around, they'd not. This was before the internet. The internet, internet. They'd never been collated in one place where you could just go and look it up like you can now. With Scott Teal's Madison Square Garden book at CrowbarPress.com being among the major sources. Anyway, point being, so. Georgianne was able to count up from like her scrapbooks the number of the garden shows that Bruno or that had been had during the Bruno era, right? And he figured, well, I'm on pretty much all of them. And well, it, from memory, he said, oh, what were we, 70%, 80% sold out? Okay, we'll take that. And that's how they figured oh, no. it out. I didn't yeah, realize no, I that. I swear to God. I, I swear did not to God. Know that. <laughs> and and that became and then Georgianne publicized those numbers because they in in all fairness they weren't trying to bullshit anybody it was just memory from years and years before right this was probably by the by the eighties right they did this and it sounded believable because there wasn't anyone saying yeah. hey that's a lie that's not right it sounded like yeah that sounds about right. Because everybody, you know, everybody that was a fan of the gardens in those days remembers all the sellouts. They don't remember the, you know, what was it, 12 or 18 months where they didn't have local television. They were putting 8,000 people in there no matter what they did. But anyway, so then later on when the books came out, because I either heard Bruno say it or talked to him about whatever. Because I'd, I'd seen Bruno last time I saw him was that he was at the 2017 Hall of Fame, right? When I was there. That was the Hall of Fame that I saw him at, correct? Yes. Anyway, he was, he was just as a guest. But anyway, you know, he, he had to say, well, you know, we didn't have the records and we had to do the best we can. You know, the, my memory, I have memories of all the great days. And he kind of mea culpa But it's still, it was the most impressive no other single personality at that point in time had had that many sellouts of Madison Square Garden, even if it wasn't as big as the story that they took and ran with. It, it Only teams, sports teams, had done it, but that was obviously multiple players and changing of, of rosters through years, where Bruno was Bruno. But now it's Bruno and Billy. All right. And me and Julio down by the schoolyard. You know, it's funny when you said that, I'm thinking of Billy Graham just because for that one year that he was the champion, he had actually, for a small period of time, the best run yeah. of sellouts of anyone in Garden history. Well, and he had the, the best percentage of all time of any uh, WWF champion, and that would continue until the modern era because they hardly sell the Garden out anymore. Uh, but... uh Billy Graham sold out a bigger percentage of his title defenses than Bruno, Pedro, Backlund, or anybody else. Every month, everyone thought, this has to be the month he's going to lose the title. He can't hold it. Well, they didn't think like that, but a bad guy's not going to hold the title forever up here. But Jim? Yes. I don't know where to start. because will, we... will a bad guy delay the program any further? Yeah, uh, I don't know. You tell me what you want to do. Mr. Hey. hey, hey, I don't know where to start. We have a lot of things to get caught up on. And we also have some things uh, that just happened last night as we are recording. Uh, I will follow you yeah. wherever you may lead. I'll tell you what, why don't we get dynamite out of the way? <laughs> and we'll do some time travel later on for ratings. But I want to have fun. We have some fun topics today. Let's get dynamite completely out of the way. Oh boy, howdy! Well, I, hold on. I've got to find it on my pad. I've got different pads for different shows, different strokes for different folks, and that's what uh, this was on April seventeenth. The AEW Dynamite broadcast from Indianapolis, Indiana, Indy, the Indy, the Indy five hundred. That's how many people showed up. Hey, see if you can look up our friend Thurston Howells statistics on how many people they had there no this would be wrestle ticks not wrestle nomics wrestle nomics deals oh. with the economics wrestle ticks deals with the ticks the, well then in that case then we need to fucking check our crotches and and spray regularly because those ticks get bad in the summertime oh that's wrestle crabs oh i'm sorry but also can we find out they said this was the Farmer's Coliseum. Is this the old Fairgrounds Coliseum? If it is, that's not only the building that I've worked there before in the 80s, but that was the building that Bruiser ran 
in the 60s and then uh, sometimes in the 70s when they went back and forth from there to the new Expo Center building. But if this was the Indi Indianapolis Old Fairgrounds Coliseum, and from what it looked like, not only is that a tough place to do TV in if you've got a big production going on, but also they couldn't have had 2,500 people in this building because I know what it's supposed to look like. And I know how much of it we didn't see. Well, a few things here, Jim. This is as of yesterday before the show, so this is not counting any walk-up or the final numbers. But WrestleTix reporting 2,495 tickets distributed. <laughs> Goddamn, was I close or what? And the Indiana Farmers Coliseum, according to Wikipedia, originally the Indiana State Fairgrounds Coliseum, and formerly the Boom. Pepsi Coliseum and the Fairgrounds Coliseum, <laughs> is a 6,500-seat indoor multi-use arena. Originally opened in 1939 as part, of, <laughs> as, as part of FDR's Works Progress Administration, which was part of the New Deal. That's what I'm... Hey, I, I'm just telling you, if they tried to fucking plug the TV truck into that building, they probably fried half of Indianapolis. As an old building, that building is 85 years old. And it's been it's been a great wrestling building, but G. Manelli Shelley. On October 31st, 1963, during a holiday on ice show, a liquefied petroleum gas leak at the concession <laughs> stand. There you go. Caused an explosion which killed 81 people and injured Jesus around 400 others. Christ. A memorial plaque was dedicated 40 years later in the building, but it has since been removed. Another. What? Another plaque wait, honoring the explosion. Them, it, wait, hold on. It took them 40 years and then they took it down? Another plaque. Another, pla <laughs> another what is so plaque. What about these 80 people in this explosion? Another plaque honoring the explosion victims currently hangs inside the building's lobby. <sighs> the Indiana Pacers played here until 1974. Yes, they certainly did. And in Market Square, because that, again, Bruiser and Snyder, and then not to get sidetracked, but it's more interesting than the AEW program, but Bruiser and Snyder, when they started running their uh, promotion, Barnett had run the Fairgrounds Coliseum, the building we're talking about, through the late 50s, early 60s. That's where Bruiser and Bob Ellis drew, you know, thousands and thousands of people and all these goddamn, you know, uh, major shows. And then when Bruiser and Snyder when they uh, branched off in 64 and Barnett went to Australia, they started primarily running the North Side Armory. Or that they, they, it, it, it may have been, it, there may have been two of them, the North Side Armory may, and also the Tyndall Armory, which I've actually been in. And then they got big enough where they ran the Fairgrounds Coliseum and then the Expo Center that opened it's one of those big, uh, like a Comic-Con building where you just have a big open space and they'd put the movable bleachers in and everything. And it was air-conditioned because that's why Sam Minnicker would always say the air-conditioned Expo Center because the Fairgrounds Coliseum wasn't air-conditioned, at least at that point. And then Market Square Arena opened up in the early 70s and... That's where they'd go for Bruiser and Sheik in a cage. But anyway... The Beatles played here in... September of 64, the Beach Boys were here, Dave Clark 5, the Rolling Stones with the Standells and the McCoys. So there's a wrestling tie-in, Rick Derringer. How about this show? 1970, Paul Revere and the Raiders with Art Linkletter. <laughs> What's that? I have no earthly idea why they would... And again, kids, Google Art Linkletter. Because we can't even go down that fucking... Should we just talk about this shit for the whole show? I'm having fun, and we have only talked about music and arenas so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, that's that's the building that AEW was in, and uh, and so at least they can't accuse them of running the NBA arenas in every town anymore. No, now they're running but, the ABA arenas in the town. <laughs> and so basically, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it, pretty soon they're going to be outdoors at Chill Howie Park <laughs> this continues 
<laughs> what I'm trying to say. Due to a bomb threat, we have to stay at Daly's place. The bomb threat is every week it bombs. <laughs> the Fairgrounds Coliseum in Indianapolis, if you put 6,500 permanent seats, as you just said, if you put a full ringside setup on a floor that big because it is also made for the fair and stock and rodeo shows and things. You get 8,000 people in there and they got apparently 2,500 tickets were sent out or given out or purchased in some fashion. And for the record, the last time they were there was September 6th for dynamite 3,006 people. <laughs> 3,006. And they didn't even, they didn't even, um, Hardly get to Angelo Poffo's sit-up record. Anyway, so immediately they come on the air, and here comes Plumber Moxley through the crowd. He's the new IWGP, or as they used to say back when I got the tapes, IWGP champion. IWGP, which stands for I don't give a fuck. And but apparently he does, Brian, because that's the point. He came out and I'm thinking, what the fuck? He is, is because he recognizes the magnitude of himself in his own mind. He's now full force trying to get this IWGP title over as the big deal. And the announcers are pushing it. And <laughs> All I'm thinking about, if if Vince McMahon had told Hulk Hogan in 1986, hey, I've made a deal with Anoki. We're going to have an IWGP world champion come in here too. Hogan's one and only response was, when do I win it? Right? Because they their AEW world champion isn't, and bless Samoa Joe, I love him, and he's, he's the best pick they got right now, especially, but there, uh, the AEW world title is not over because of the fact that there's an ROH title and a fucking Continental Breakfast title and a fucking interworldal Continental fucking Divide title and every other kind of title. And now here comes that it's a prettier belt. And actually, between Samoa Joe and Moxley, Moxley is the bigger mainstream name because of his run in the WWE, even though it was a different name, that, you can't hide that fucking face. So now they've got another world champion that's going to go out there and fucking harangue us with another 10 or 15 minutes like he did here about how badass he is and how much sweat and blood that, in, that he has put into this and how fucking he eats bones and... Drinks people's piss. I don't know. It, it and that's a and I tap the, out to your gym teacher, and and then taps out to the fucking you know Papa John's delivery guy. But they're confusing the issue with their world title. Better ingredients, and then also, even if you overlook what he looks like and overlook how rotten his work is, in the past he has given promos on occasion that were good, that made sense, that sounded coherent. I remember one we praised when they were in another bad position. He had to come out and give a rah-rah speech for the company. It was a couple years ago. But that was all before he went to rehab. He was coherent then. Now he, now it's just him out there about how badass and determined he is and always has been with the pints of sweat and the blood and the crowd chants, you deserve it because... The few people that decided to come believe he does. But that's the promo. But here's the goddamn... The technical aspect of this was abominable, and he wouldn't face the hard camera because there was absolutely nobody on that side of the building, and because Moxley craves the attention of the few and the adulation of the few instead of the recognition of the many, he couldn't work, uh, he couldn't even do a 360 and talk to all sides equally, and they would shoot it hopefully like, you know, it was, he had to instead turn to hard camera right and talk to those people because that way the people on his left and the people in front of him were the only people in the fucking building. 
But as a result, any time they took their hard camera shot, it was just him standing to the side, or you should looking at, at his side while he's talking some other way. So they try to go to a handheld to get his face. But then the way that he's standing, because he's disregarding anything about being a professional television performer and gone straight to address the house on national television. They get the handheld shot of Moxley with his face. There's nothing behind him but a big screen that's covering the empty half of the arena so that you can't see it. There's nobody there. And they're feeding program audio, not program audio, but they're feeding the the ISO of the hard camera shot. I know I'm getting in the weeds here with inside baseball, but the the bottom line of what you're looking at is you're looking at Moxley talking to the crowd straight on while over his shoulder is looks like it's suspended from the ceiling is a ring with another ringside section behind it and another Moxley standing talking in a different direction. Oh, uh, bizarro. It and it was it, it almost gave me seizures. It <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> It's just, it either looks like, again, there's a ring suspended from the balcony with like two rows of fans behind it and another guy in the ring talking to them while if this guy's talking over the camera to another set of people that we can't fucking see. Because when they go to the handheld camera, the only fans that you can see in the building because of the angle in which that he's positioned himself are the ones on the fucking screen that are the first three rows of ringside on the other side of the fucking... I, 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 I give zero fucks and three shits. This, we didn't shoot television like this in OVW. So it almost, it almost looked like one of those old, for John Fell, just for him, one of those old DC Infinity covers where Superman is sitting <laughs> in the barber chair getting his hair cut, but the scissors are breaking, but he's reading the comic, the Superman comic book where on the cover he's sitting in the barber's chair with the barber cutting it and he's reading the comic and it goes on i don't know if that was for john fell or travis heckle i can't decide it, it could be for <laughs> also. Uh, but anyway so trying to listen to that he had a raving meltdown trying to convince people what he was saying he hopped from subject to subject and he's called out powerhouse hobbs for next week because he wants to get at the phallus family so he's gonna beat uh in some decisive fashion the only member of the family is really totally worth a shit right now and uh, finally it was over can we somehow petition change.org for a mandatory mental evaluation for plumber moxley i don't know i don't know how much success they've had recently in actually forcing anything to happen you know he came through the crowd and that was the liveliest the crowd was it's a big moment the show's starting and here comes moxley to wild thing the crowd got quieter and quieter. By the time he challenged Powerhouse Hobbs, they didn't give a shit. And especially because of the way Hobbs has been used. He didn't challenge a main eventer. He said, you know, Heenan family, I want Haku. <laughs> Haku's a badass to everyone else. When you were a kid, you're like, yeah, it's not Andre. It's not Rick Rude. Again, the promo wasn't especially good. Feels everyone, I've said it before, everyone feels insecure right now. And they're trying to talk their way into people seeing them the way they think they should be seen. Oh, yeah, his whole point was everybody said it was impossible that I'd never hold this great prestigious belt. That's because they're all Japanese marks. They talk about these goddamn things like they're holy grails when their own company belts are fucking worthless. Yeah, and that's a conversation, by the way, for another time. It's not even about Moxley here, but since the beginning of AEW, New Japan is nothing. They've lost all their top homegrown talent. Their foreign talent gets signed up by Tony, and then they have to hope they can work with Tony and use any of these people. The state of New Japan right now is not good, and John Moxie being IWGP champion is just mildly indicative of that. Well, and now the problem is we're, it, it's, this is going to morph into IWGP television because then all these guys can fulfill their dream fantasy scenarios without having to get on a plane. Um... Mercedes Moon. 
was in the in the back in front of a I don't know if it was a green screen, made a nice little set, and she did a uh, an audition for a direct to video movie. I think this week, rather than just the recitation of memorized lines, it was well, normally she's got the the inflection and the passion and the emotion of a table reading. Uh, but now I think this was an uh, uh, official audition for some type of direct video production because she put a little bit more oomph into it. Maybe it was written by Alexandra Pepperday. It reminded me of uh, years ago, you would know better than I, there was a special about Ring of Honor and it showed you and that dirty Carrie Silken and maybe one or two other people. Oh, come on. No, he's a piece of shit. Uh, they showed you guys interview, not interviewing, but having aspiring wrestlers cut promos and you critiqued it. Mostly yes. you, you did all the talking. You remember that? I think one yeah. of the guys in the LWO was one of the guys there who uh, did that. Zima Ion or whatever his name is. Um, and I'm trying to think of what outlet it was on. That was when I had just started there and they were still on HD net, which now is access TV, but um, then was Mark Cuban's production. And I'm, I vamped around and I can't, but some media outlet wanted to do a piece on them. And yes, we, I participated in that. And I can't remember now what the, was what it the, the history was. channel? It was, it was some weird possibly. Home. Yeah. It was, some it, weird it home. was not Yeah, It wasn't something you would imagine. Well, my point was going to be, that's what her promo seemed like. A yeah. woman auditioning for promo class or someone in front of the mirror. I guess maybe because of what her run, if we're going to call it, that has been so far. Now, every time she's out there, I'm watching her more intently. Do something. Let's hear you talk naturally. Let's see anything. Let's see the crowd react without, you know, the crowd aren't chanting CEO. Her theme music is literally <laughs> blasting a chant of CEO. But no, this wasn't good. This the, 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 was this felt like an audition. Is, the crowd is chanting, see you later. This felt like a promo audition. And uh, and again, it was a pre-tape, so who knows how many times they shot it. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> they, they, how many times they shot it, they still couldn't put it out of its misery. <laughs> so anyway, we're gonna we're gonna see we'll we'll flow right into this next. Uh, segment here all in one clip uh, apparently because it's going to affect what we're talking about next because the first actual wrestling match on this program was the mixed tag team match between Brody King and Julia Hart versus Edge and Willow Nightingale and so it's come to this that Edge was the one of the more prominent stars of the last 20 years in the wrestling industry has come to this company and he's in mixed tag team matches within six months. Um, and edge got in the ring and saw immediately on the screen. He's the first one in the ring. He didn't come out with his partner. I guess she, Willow Nightingale gets to enter after edge in the over and Brody and Julia for that matter in the overall scheme of this but it wouldn't work otherwise would it that he looks up on the screen and in the back Willow has been attacked that should be some kind of fucking meme attacked in the back if, if you know it could happen to you at any time attacked in the back but they hit Willow hit Willow hit Willow and she's laying there selling and, and grimacing and people are checking on her. And suddenly, Brody King comes from behind and levels Edge and boom, and just gets him on the floor and beats him up. And they start to match and it's a handicap match, which of course, Julia is not going to tag in because I think their rules are still, they got to tag in the girls and the girls and the guys and the guys or whatever. Because now are we, he are we hearing that Julia Hart is hurt? Try to say that real quick. You don't know anything. Uh, you know, this AEW women's division. Um, there was a there was a rumor she's hurt. I don't seek out uh, information about it. I, I had heard that a while ago. She was in the match. There were lights. They went out. They came on. <laughs> I don't want to see Edge anymore. As soon as they did the angle, I didn't want to see any of this. They started with a mixed match. 
<laughs> well, wait a minute. Come on, come on. Even now. Willow's You're... music is starting to piss me off. It sounds like a British game show in the '90s. Just awful. <laughs> but first of all, you know, you can't just skip over some of this artistry. Oh, but also, you were you were on the the Willow fan. Uh, no, Willow I like her. Train for a while, and her music is starting to piss me off. I don't say I have a problem just... with her. It's this presentation. It's not that you want to cuss her out as a person. No, 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 no. Not at all. I think well, she's good. I think she's good. If I was WWE, I would want to sign Willow Nightingale, but I would give her new music. And and potentially a new name, but we'll get into that. But nevertheless, that's the thing is it becomes Edge versus Brody King. And Brody King is... <sighs> Honestly, I'm seeing, you know, a small territory, you'd want to have a guy like that around in the old days, a big fucking tattooed, weird looking fucking guy, right? But right now he's the typical fat tattooed indie guy that tries to do a lot of shit, but he can't throw a punch or a forearm. And it's just bleh. And there's, have we, have we ever heard him speak? Can he? We don't know. Well, he was, see, he would speak sometimes no. in the Bohemian Rhapsody video <laughs> things. That, <laughs> That's right. That's but anyway, but finally, here's the thing. I wanted to explain what they fucking botched here without even knowing what they were fucking doing. Because now you've got the heel team. And normally, this is not in a mixed tag team match, but what they were going for here is the heel team has the advantage numerically two against one, right? And you get the heat going on the single baby face, and he's, He's fighting and he's selling and he's trying to fight back, but they're just been finally they're really fucking pummeling this guy, right? And the baby face, and he's just he's all fucked up. And uh, at that point, I always like to put in that then the fucking heel would hit a finish on the fucking baby face after they'd really beat him up good, cover one, two, and pull him up. And then they look and they said, now he's he's alone, he's helpless, we're just going to kick the shit out of this guy as long as we want to. And right at that point, that's when the babyface partner that was taken out for whatever reason, stuff thrown at his eyes or hit overhead with a chair, he, he comes out with an eye patch on or his head bandage wrapped up or fucking whatever, and he runs down and he jumps up on the apron of the ring and he puts one hand on the fucking turnbuckle or grabs the goddamn tag rope and he reaches the other hand out for the tag and he looks at the people and everybody comes up. And now the people are into it and the fucking guy baby face on the apron is stomping his foot like, come on, Tits McGee, come and tag me. Get the tag and the people get behind. And now the heels see that and they goddamn get frantic. Oh, we got to put this guy away now. Fuck. So they fucking started to, we, they shoot the baby face off and they go for a big backdrop, but the fucking baby face sunset flips and rolls through and he's on the other side of the ring and he's got to dive to make a tag, but they pull him back. Oh God, we got to, oh, now the people want him to tag more and the heels try something else and the baby face eludes that gets a little bit closer and maybe they pull him back again. Maybe the third time they go for the double backdrop and he kicks one. And small packages the other, and he kicks out, and then he fucking rolls and dives and tags the fucking fresh baby face. And then he makes a big can. That's a hot tag, right? That's why you do that angle, to get that spot. Do you know what they did, Brian? What did they do? Willow came down in the pe waving it to people as I was shaking off her injuries, and the people are yelling, and she got up on the apron. And fucking Brody King got Edge in a front face lock and Edge stuck his foot out backwards and Willow tagged his foot with her hand. Oh. And that was it. That was the tag. Like tagging a, a foot has ever been a thing that has ever been legal or allowed or even tried or attempted until a few years ago with indie fucking wrestling. And secondly... When she tags his foot, then she gets in and he she jumps up on the turnbuckle or the second rope or ass on a turnbuckle, top turnbuckle, and he lets Edge go of the front face lock and stand and she double or she double. Yeah, she's big enough. She cross bodies him off the fucking ropes and he takes a bump like he's standing there looking at her. But that was the sum total of the milking for the tag. And she tagged a foot and then came in. And so 
At the point I was going through this program, Hotchkiss Featherbottom had come over here to pick up uh, signed merchandise going to the fine customers at Cornette's Collectibles at jimcornette.com. And I said, watch, I said, you know the angle where the fucking two against one and then the baby face comes down for the tag and you start going in the hope spots, right? He said, yes, because he, as I've mentioned before in a previous life, trained at OVW under Danny Davis and Rip Rogers and wrestled for some period of time, so he knows what the fuck is happening. And I said, watch the way they did it. And I hit it from right when fucking Willow came down. And his mouth opened. He said, what the fuck was that? Damn. So anyway, Julia jumped down to the floor because I guess she's hurt or whatever and they can't get a hold of her. But then, as the referee was distracted otherwise and where with, with four, Julia came back and hit Willow with a chain I say, hit Willow, hit Willow, hit Willow, but only in a fashion. Maybe you would say the word barely in the vicinity of her head. And Willow went down like she'd been hit by a fucking boat oar. And Edge and Brody King bumped out. <laughs> what? What's the matter? What? I haven't heard boat oar using that. Have you seen? A, have you seen what happens when you hit a motherfucker with a boat oar? Especially if you're you got a good fucking backswing. So. <laughs> And Julia put the stretch on Willow because the referee saw nothing and they won. But then Julia wouldn't let go. And here came Mercedes Moon. And she hit the ring. Remember, there's issues between her and Willow. We barely know what they are. She seems reluctant to speak about them. But she hits the ring and Julia Hart bails out. And Edge had completely disappeared. Uh, when he uh, bumped out with Brody King for all of this. But then, as Mercedes has the chair in her hand that she's brought with her to chase away the evil Julia Hart, it looks like she's thinning. She's thinning about whether she ought to say something to Willow with that chair, and Edge comes in, and she smiles and drops it and and shakes hands with Edge, and everybody goes to their... Their respective corners. Their respective check cashing place. <laughs> the, the fast pay. <laughs> fast pay, or that's the, right. the cap cash or whatever it may be. Well, that was a segment, wasn't it? The hell was that all about? So Edge is now involved in this tomfoolery and Merced. I bet Mercedes is making more money than Edge. What do you think? Ooh, that's a, that's a tough question because I don't know the answer, but I know no, the way Tony I, I, plays. I, I, bet it's, I bet it's fairly close, but uh, don't worry. Mercedes will, you know, will somehow bring Edge down to her level before it's over with, so it'll be worth about the same thing. Oh, uh, ay, ay, ay. All right. I, I don't want to watch. I, you know, I'm, I wasn't a big fan of him towards... I was happy when Edge came back. And then I hated the Orton feud. Judgment Day didn't really click. And then they kicked him out. You didn't. I like Judgment Day with him. You didn't. I didn't. I, I remember that I did. Because his promos. Because he's too actory in his promos. And it's one thing being actory. It's another thing being actory with that Toronto accent that just comes across extra actory. Um, you know, maybe you should try Second City. I really don't know. Not, not extraordinary, but extra actory. That's right. And... You say he's one of the biggest stars of the last 20 years. He was off for 10 of those years. No, I, I said one of the more prominent names yeah. of the last 20 because the of name that Edge tenure. Was. The name yes. Edge was a prominent name. The name Adam Copeland doesn't mean anything. Well. That's the problem. That's part of the problem. The other problem is what he's doing over here. He said it. He wanted to do his dream matches. The Christian feud never clicked. That's the biggest missed opportunity with him there could be. Now he's doing mixed matches. As part of an overall feud with the House of Black and their failure to pay the electric bill, <laughs> this, I, you know, I'm sick of seeing him. I've already burned out on him in AEW. What are they going to do with him that's going to get you interested? Who's he going to work with that you're going to want to see it? It's never a case of, I hope he'll teach someone something. That's unrealistic at this point. You don't go to AEW to teach younger wrestlers how to do things right. Well, you might, but you ain't going to end up happy with it. All right, should we 
Should we move on to the next million dollar acquisition where again I violated my normal policies and went against my better instincts and watched the buckaroos for the most part to see if the the Japanese Cody could impress me? And uh, can I just talk about what I saw real real briefly? The Bucks and O'Cody? Well, actually that's a, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> what, you were going to say that? I was going to say that. <laughs> I was going to say, I think from now on, he just needs to be, instead of Japanese Cody, he needs to be O'Cody. <laughs> because uh, I don't understand what they're going for because they contradict themselves, even if you like them and want to support them in some type of way they contradict their own shit first you got the buckaroos maddie and nikki and o cody at the gorilla pos backstage at the of course now we've seen the gorilla position now what it looks like in a goddamn the modern day in the wwe it's bigger than my first apartment and it's fucking decorated and lit i mean they have a woman come in and clean it's amazing and here, this is a goddamn tent like the old days that AEW has with draped in black everywhere with Tony Khan sitting there with a headset on, draped in black. The only white you can see is around his nostrils. And <laughs> a fucking empty table with a monitor on it. And there's the buckaroos and O'Cody standing there because they start... You start seeing a, a, a video package on the FTR and Bucks and their rivalry or whatever, and then you hear their whiny voices saying, cut it off, that's, the, that's crummy, and they do their fake heel bit, but they're doing it while Tony is sitting there nodding up and down and taking instructions from them and not disagreeing with them in any way, and if he's making a face that is somehow supposed to indicate that he thinks there's something out of the way of the way that these EVPs are behaving. You can't tell. So this not only fell flat because it's their fake heel way of speaking, but also because <clears throat> we don't understand if, if Tony's sitting there and he's supposed to be the Raven baby face to boss this whole thing. And he's uh, just fine with whatever it is you people are trying to do to supposedly get heat. Well, do you understand what I'm saying, Brian? What the fuck is, why is there any conflict here then? It doesn't make much sense. Why does Tony Khan want heel EVPs? Yes. Why does he allow them to do these things? Why, why is he hamstrung? His hands are tied. He has no choice. They've got his, his fucking trust fund kidnapped in a cellar somewhere being held for ransom. So the match is Maddie and Nikki and O'Cody against Danny Garcia, Penthouse, and Pac. And out of what a fucking random babyface team, right, for these people to... But out of the bunch, Garcia's working harder. I'll tell you that. He's working harder. He's still yeah. got a... I, I'm just going to say, he, he is working harder, and it's impressed... Me, I noticed it, and then they beat him, and he's the guy who got killed. Well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. He's, he's, he's working harder. He's still got a mope face, but I think he's worked on his body, and his work is, we never said his work sucked. He does questionable things, but athletically, he can do moves. But again, they've by now they've beat him, and then they, we've you know mostly forgotten about him, and they, they bring him back. And lay him out again. He's a guy that would need to go somewhere for a while longer before he's ready for national television from a look. But the point is, out of all of these motherfuckers, Pac, it looks great. He can do great shit, but he has lousy matches because he uses all that athletic ability to do indie bullshit. He can't put a logical match together. We've seen that many times. And so, and... A penthouse, you get what you get. And so I'm thinking, is there any way that Okada is going to be able to impress me in the middle of this environment? Okada, for the record, for anyone who's listening who doesn't exactly understand what you're referencing, we should probably say his real name, too. Well, I thought it was Okada. You just, you just named him. 
as far as I'm concerned, it's easier to say than Japanese Cody. Because that's what they did. They traded down to a guy that looks confusingly similar to, that has blonde hair and wears a suit, but just ain't got any pizzazz to him. And then during this match, they're just, it's, it's every indie six-man tag team match that's ever been held, right? But at one point, this is, I'll, I'll move on to the finish and we'll be done with this, but it was, it was indicative of how the buckaroos don't understand what even they're trying to do. At one point, Maddie gets the PA mic, the public address system for ki the kids, and he does his own commentary on the match. Uh, not, not unlike Jerry Lawler used to do as a heel in the WWF back in the early 90s, except unlike it in that Lawler, his shits are more entertaining than Maddie is. But finally, he gets in the ring and he gets on Garcia. And he's taunting him and he's pie-facing him and he's trash-talking him. And he's almost like he's being a real heel, right? And, he's, and Garcia's got this great look on his face. And he set it up where if Garcia had snatched a waist lock and picked him up and belly to backed him, it would have got a huge pop for Daniel Garcia and a huge pop for the fucking move and a huge pop for the change in momentum. And he would have, the heel would have gotten a little comeuppance there. But instead, the spot that obviously Maddie called, because I don't think Garcia is telling Maddie what to do. Garcia snatches the waist lock on him and picks him up for a belly to back, but he's got to hold him at the top so Matt, who has the microphone in his hand, can get his funny line in and go, oh, we're, we're good, we're good, put me down. And is the people chuckled in the building, and then he gives him the suplex, and it stepped all over Garcia's pop. It changed the focus of attention from Garcia giving this little prick what he deserved to oh we forgot this is all fun and games and we're not supposed to take it seriously and got us back to goddamn reality which was this was children playing fucking wrestler and that's how smart they aren't did you even see that spot i did see that spot i watched this match because i'm intrigued now by the lack of heat for anything with the bucks you know they tied themselves <sighs> in the past to omega who had a fan base Cody kind of tied himself to them, but then things got reversed. By that time, though, they were not really working with Cody on air, if you noticed. But they tie themselves to people. Now they're tied to Okada, who's not over here, beyond the New Japan fan. And nothing they've done has gotten them heat. Their promos, airing the punk thing in character, the behind-the-scenes stuff, less fans, no heat. It's intriguing to watch now, the Bucks, because they were trying, if you watch their picture of picture, they were doing everything they could to get the crowd to make any noise at all. Well, they, yeah, I, I, I don't even know, come to think of it, would that have been something they would have called for Matt to go and get the microphone during the commercial break? And, or was it just something they, they were trying to do to get people up off their ass? But anyway, as speaking of O'Cody, so here's what he did to impress me. Nada. Some shit that anybody else could do and probably do better. I don't think he's worth a round-trip ticket from Japan if they put him in baggage. And then he tombstone Garcia, and then tombstone Penthouse. Penthouse's head was a foot off the fucking mat when he hit him with that one. And then... Maddie and Nikki double super kick Garcia and Okada hit him with that short arm clothesline. One, two, three. And then they brought a ladder in and folded Garcia up in it and beat him up in that until Pac came back and ran him off with a hammer. That's what I was talking about. It wasn't just Daniel Garcia taking the pin. They destroyed yeah, him after oh, the match. Yeah, they, they, beat, they beat him up, beat him, and then fucking left him laying after uh, uh, but uh how many weeks in a row have we seen just random six-man teams on this show we were like last week wasn't it shibata and jericho and hook and we we're like what are they doing together and then a week before it was someone else well they have to because nobody wants to see that but then it it you know it doesn't get people ready to get beat by 
the Buckaroos and Okoti because they got to be together. Or I guess maybe the Buckaroos could be in Okoti's corner. They're about to have this pay-per-view match. They've now made it a ladder match with FTR. Does anyone care about the feud? Does anyone really care about the match? Does the backstory and their attempts to justify showing the punk footage and how it backfired on them, does it justify any of it? Does any of this feel like it's clicking at all? They're showing the punk footage took attention away from this match yeah. and and diminished it rather than heating it up. And one last question, and this may be an overarching one we ask time and time again, are the Young Bucks the most overpaid tag team? Well, forget about tag team. Overpaid act in wrestling history if you look at the actual results versus what they have or what they're getting. Serious I conversation would, I there. Would, I would say you would have to make, I mean, we don't know. We do know that probably the most overpaid talent in the history of wrestling is either currently now or at one point has been a member of Tony Khan's roster. At this point, I think we can safely say that, but you could make a, a and as, as a package, it, 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 might be, it might be a runaway if you look at it with the buckaroos in the top spot. Jericho may get jealous, though, and uh, keep doing what he's doing. Well, that, that's why I'm thinking, with the, you know, with, uh, Jericho might come out on top as a, as a single overpaid personality, but if you take the other two dimwits as a package, that could override that. And Jericho, to be fair, he meant something the first year till everybody had seen... The state of him. Did this and match he, make you want to see FTR versus the Bucks in a ladder match at the pay per view, or even Okada <laughs> versus Pack at the pay per view? No, I don't. I don't want to see Okada against Pack anymore. And I forgot about fucking FTR and the Buckaroos at the pay per view after this was over with. So I don't. I don't think that I did, or they did, or it did, or whatever the grammatical correctness would be to answer your question. But that's just me. And we're at the 9 o'clock hour, Brian, and you know it was a big deal here because they, it was time now to call the aforementioned Chris Jericho, whiny J, out to the ring, uh, along with Hook. Taz got them together. There's Taz in the ring, which we have... Have we seen Taz do an in-ring interview in, in four years of this television or however long it's been. Not since he was a heel manager. He was actually really good as a heel manager. I like. Oh, that's right. I, I forgot. Yeah. So is, so he get, he's in the ring because he's got hook and Jericho together. They need to talk this out. And talk what out? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And I know Taz is uh, again, attempting to support his son's career by being involved in this and and you know probably doesn't feel like saying well how about we do none of this this way because it looks like shit but you've got Taz in the ring that has called Hook and Jericho together but he's not he's one of the announcers of the program but he's not facilitating the conversation he's standing there in the ring apparently not wanted to interject himself by Jericho so he's just standing there. The floor is yours. And Jericho does his over-the-top egotistical heel thing that is, it, it, if he, as we mentioned this before, if he was trying to sucker Hook in to deceive Hook to be his partner so he could <clears throat> sap the adrenochrome of his, you know, fucking youthfulness or whatever, in some kind of plot, then he wouldn't be so over the top, obvious, play acting the the greatness of me and being that full of shit, right? Just out in public, nobody would believe it. So we did, but he did it again. <laughs> You've got to understand how great I am. And Taz even and then he starts saying, "Hey, now hold on a second. Nope, nope. You stay out of this." And he's talking about that. You know, Hook has never been taught any better which would offend a parent and Taz said now wait a minute no no you stay out of this but meanwhile Hook the guy that they want to like in this equation they want the fans to like in this equation is leaning in the goddamn corner 
with his fucking hood or his hat or whatever he's wearing on his head down over his eyes, eating a bag of potato chips with his legs crossed, leaning on the ropes. Okay, the disrespectful fucking troubled youth thing may work for your entrance, but when your father's standing there in a fucking ring, Junior, put some goddamn spine on you and stand up straight and pay the fucking attention like a grown adult. Because now Hook's making himself look like a goddamn dick when there's something allegedly important going on here that his father has asked him to be a part of and he's just jacking off in the corner. Do you see where I'm going with this? I was surprised that he just stood there while Jericho a couple times put down his dad, yeah. Because also, not even just put down his dad while he stood, but the way he was standing there when his father's asked him to come in the ring and speak to this other guy. Put the fucking potato chips down. It's cute, except you look like a jack-off without a fucking job. And I know that may be your audience, but I don't know why people would look up to someone if they can look next to him in row D and C. So anyway, finally, when Taz goes to stop Jericho from being so heelish and mealy-mouthed and everything for the third time, Jericho turns around and just, apropos of nothing, shoves Taz to the ground and just turns back like he turns his back on the human submission machine. And, and the announcer said, well, Taz has, has had knee problems in recent years. Okay, but he got in a fucking ring. If you shove Taz down, then Taz, if, if, to quote Monty Python, if you cut both of his legs off, he'll crawl on his belly like a reptile to you. He just had to sell a weak two-handed shove by being down on a knee, I guess catching his breath for the rest of the, the what the fuck, right? Then Hook gets mad. But instead of goddamn pulling that goddamn hat off or fucking whatever, he just goes over and snatches Jericho and pushes him back in a corner and suddenly becomes the goddamn... It becomes the boss here. I'll show you how good I am anytime, any place, anywhere. Now get out of my ring. I don't know if it's Jericho's ring hook, but it definitely ain't your ring yet. What the fuck? And and then Jericho just slinks off when he's told go, go, and he's pointing go, get out of my ring. But it, 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 <sighs> what the fuck is going on here? Are you there? I thought that was for the general public, that question. No, that was for you. What's what going on here? Well, I'll tell you what's going on here. Chris Jericho is floundering like always. He's also got a bubble head filled with bad ideas. But he thinks they're brilliant, and usually he won't give up on them. And right now, Hook's stuck. I mean, we've said it on the show, it is funny. Jericho must be listening recently. He's trademarked or filed for trademark the Jericho Vortex. The Jericho Vortex. Because we talk about how wrestlers get stuck in the vortex of Jericho and never are the same again. He listed a bunch of wrestlers we worked with and how they allegedly came out better on the other side. As he's listing it, you're like, you know what? You don't see it, man. That isn't the case. Other than MJF, who had to have a complete recovery from one year of working with the guy, everyone else comes out for the worse. Everyone. And now they're trying to make that part of the thing. He's trying to trademark, I guess, the learning tree that you sit under the learning tree because <laughs> of you using the Ernie Ladd story on the show or oh God the quotes. Almighty. <laughs> it's bad. Everything Chris Jericho has touched for years now has just been bad. And it get, continues to get worse and he runs out of guys to work with. So after Hook, it'll be who's the next person that is going to get dragged down into bad comedy, bad acting, poorly thought out multi-week shit that's unnecessary. It's going to keep happening for years and years to come. But, <sighs> but, but, you know, Jim. Yes. What? <laughs> we forgot about that, didn't we? Are we done? Are we still talking about the angle? I, for, I forget. No, we, no, no, we're done with that. We're done with the end. Good. Cause I was going to say, yes. maybe Hook didn't react the way he normally would have. I actually thought for a second, you know, maybe Taz is going to, Fucking hook Jericho. You know, hook. I mean, grab him from behind and put him in yes. something. 
And that's why Hook is so calm, because he knows his dad, who he must be conspiring with, is going to do something to this putz. No, that didn't happen at all. He shoved Taz and he fell down. Yes. But maybe if Hook had a good cell phone plan, he would have been able to call for help. Well, as a matter of fact, while Taz was over there standing there with his dick in his hand doing nothing because it was laid out for him to basically do nothing but get shoved down, he could have texted Hook, who could have had his cell phone and his bag of chips, and he could have read it, hey, I'll grab this guy from behind and you fucking hit him in the fucking nose. But unfortunately, you know what happened? You know, times have been hard these days. The whole... The whole East Village up there, or St. Mark's Place, or wherever the fuck you're talking about, it's in a recession, and Hook couldn't afford his cell phone plan. Well, it's kind of the exact opposite. Now it's just filled with rich kids from NYU, and they've kind of driven every mom-and-pop shop and every record shop and every great place that made that place tick, the East Village, and, yeah. of course, St. Mark's Place. Yeah, well, but for the, sake of this, for the sake of this spot, they're in a recession. There's no money there whatsoever. They're all broke. They can't afford their cell phones. But I'll tell you how those poor people could afford their cell phones, Brian. They could go to our friends at Mint Mobile because they got phone plans for $15 a month when you get the three-month deal. And uh, that's unlimited talking and texting and dataing. You can data your ass off, baby. You can text anybody you want to. You can talk. To any no good, sorry, gum bump and sack of snake feces that will talk back to you. And if you want to call somebody and they say hello and you tell them who you are and they hang up, you've still talked to them. It's not our fault if you're unpopular. But Mint Mobile can get you a $15 a month deal to do all those things. Why you can you can send the improper pictures of your genitalia to your girlfriend on a, a deal like this. There's no limit to the fun you can have with these hoity-toity, newfangled phones they've got well, these days. I don't know what you're talking about, but let's just talk about anyone having a typical smartphone. You can use your phone and get Mint Mobile. I don't know what you're... Yes. You don't know what's what, going on. What, what, do, what do people do with phones? Well, they make phone calls where there's unlimited talking. That's what you do on the phone. You talk, or they, they send these text messages. The kids do. Well, you can you can type all day long and then some for unlimitedness here. And the data includes the pictures of your data. And you send those out to people, apparently, these days. That's, that's a way to introduce yourself to somebody. Used to, it was a calling card. Now it's a picture of your junk. But you Don't do, do that, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Don't. A hello will well, do. Well, the ladies are not going to be doing it unless it's somebody else's junk that they've photographed out in the field. Well, don't... You can't deny that. You cannot disagree with me that there are no ladies out in the audience that are going to be sending people pictures of their penises. The point of the matter is... Unless it's they're the not... penises that they're legally married to or engaged in some kind of committed relationship with. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, do not send any photos of your genitalia out there because your phone could be hacked and these photos can get out there and everyone will see well, just that's how true. sloppy your tits are. That's it. Well, in that case, take pictures of other people and send those pictures instead. That way, when you get hacked and they put out your pictures, you can say, ha ha, I got you. That's not me. See, now there's a well, loophole. There's Nobody's a loophole, that but you know what? I am sure that our good friends at Mint Mobile, and we really like our friends at Mint Mobile, I'm sure they would like us to talk about how to tell, talk how about to their plan these, for other people. How to get these plans. Well, uh, folks, Mint Mobile is going to rescue you from the high prices with these premium wireless plans that start at $15 a month. They got the nation's largest 5G network. And you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your own phone number with you. Just make one up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They'll take it. Whatever number you want for your phone, just bring your phone number. And along with all of your existing contacts, everyone you know, get them in the car, take them down to the store. They'll vouch for you. And ditch the overpriced wireless deal. When, and again, folks, you can send out the pictures, Valentine's Day, Memorial Day, any, any, any time is good for a picture of your junk. And when people think about dicks, they think about Mint Mobile. So right no, now... No, when people think about a good plan, an affordable plan, a easy plan to use with your existing phone, and things like that, they think of Mint Mobile. 
A good plan, an affordable plan, an easy plan, a master plan. That's what it is, a master. Get this new customer offer now. Of course, if you're an old customer, you can't get this plan because you've already got the plan. But if you're a new customer, you can get this plan, so plan to get it. And make your plans now, ladies and gentlemen. The new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just $15 a month, you can go to mintmobile.com slash JCE. That is mintmobile.com slash JCE. The slash JCE is the important part because if you don't do that, you ain't going to get this goddamn deal. Now, there is a $45 upfront payment required because that is equivalent, of course, to $15 a month times three months. Do the fucking math, Sherlock. Speeds may be slower above 40 GB on unlimited plan, whatever the fuck that means. And additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. You know what? If you're in, I think, Guatemala or the British West Indies, there are certain restrictions. Uh, you may need to look that up. See Mint Mobile for details. That's right, Mint Mobile for details, and with this That's promo what I code, just said. what's that promo code, Jim? That's what I'm saying. JCE, how many more times you want me to say it? Well, Jim, let's slash our way back into the AEW Dynamite review. We just finished the uh, Jericho dramatic segment. What's next on the agenda? Well, well, uh, you'll be glad to know that Maria May wrestled Diana Perazzo. Mariah. She she did. Mariah May. Well, she may what? No, Mariah May is her name. It's not Maria May. It's Mariah May. You said Maria May. It's Mariah May. Well. And she was against De Deanna, Durana. Durana Perrazzo. <laughs> she was against Deanna Perrazzo. How do you say that name again? How do you, you spell that, that name? How, why should I take your word for any pronunciation at this point? If I ask you to spell Deanna Perrazzo, do you think you could do it? D-E-O-N-N-A-P-U-R-A. Z Z O. Or is there two R's? Two R's. Two R's. To, uh, I caught it first. According to the computer. Well, anyway, they wrestled. And I want to put on my, 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 my fast forward button and skip you. <laughs> so, Deanna won. And then Tony Storm attacked her. And then Thunder Rosa made the save and saved Deanna. And the heels bailed out to the floor, and then Deanna began arguing and shoving with Thunder Rosa, who just saved her. And then Maria, unless she's the wind, and then she'd be Mariah. Mariah. Because, because everyone knows they call the wind Mariah. They call the wind Mary. Or the wind, no, the wind actually cried Mary. Sorry. Yes, the wind cried Mary. See, but the other people are calling the wind Mariah. Well, Maria May pulled Deanna out to the floor, and they got in a fight, and Rosa beat up Storm and put her in a camel clutch and then got out a lipstick thing and drew lipstick all over her face. That's what happened there. It's a big fucking hot angle, I'm telling you. It's like blinding the junkyard dog. Let's see if it blinds the audience. I can't wait for the ratings to come in. I will say this. In the middle of the shit show is that, that is the AEW women's division. Thunder Rosa lays her stuff in. It looks good. Whatever she does looks good. Well, she even laid the lipstick in. Uh, and then we had, of course, the the cheetah segment of this Tarzan movie where Pockets had a match with Shane Taylor. Have you seen Shane Taylor? I have. He's got Mabel's ass with Moe's upper body. What the fuck? That it ain't looks right. Like that ain't right. It, <laughs> this is really not <laughs> If you shoved him down, he'd have to be flapping his arms where you could tell whether he was rolling or walking. So, anyway, at the, the only reason I tried to look at a little bit of this, but I will take their word for it, that a number of people contacted me on Twitter after this aired saying that there was a, a, a light to medium let's go pockets chant when he was getting beat up. Uh, but apparently even the AEW fans that were the ones that were hardy enough to come out in Indianapolis are tired of the joke by now, like the rest of us were tired of it the first time that we saw it. But at least if this guy was Tony's son or brother, you could understand, you know, Big Daddy, George Goulas, 
pockets, but otherwise, I don't know what's going on here. Did you hear about the Let's Go Pockets chant? I heard about it. I watched the match on Fast Forward because of Pockets, but I wanted to also see a little bit of Shane Taylor because I know they're doing something with him. He's been on their show a bunch lately. He has a stable and everything with a go-go. He, 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 he ought to be stable with a center of gravity that low. You probably can't move him with a goddamn tank. Listen, what, what's the matter this, with this you? man was on a mission and <laughs> he failed. He failed against pockets. The let's go pockets thing is one of two things. It's people who listen to and or subscribe to your thoughts on him. Or it is a bunch of random fans that showed up one night and said, this guy sticks his hand in his pockets. <laughs> let's let him hear it. You know, maybe they... Maybe that's how they were able to get this many people in the building. They, people didn't know what they were coming in to see. It was like, <laughs> wrestling? Okay, we'll go. Well, what's this? Who's this guy? Anyway, somebody said the other day on Twitter, well, we don't see as many Jim Cornette face T-shirts in the audience in AEW anymore. I said, you don't see as many T-shirts of any kind in the audience anymore for AEW. It's only natural all of these numbers would shrink. Aggie, are you ready for the main event? That wasn't the main event. I'm ready that, for the main event. That wasn't the Oh, we got more. Not much, but we got more. Um, and they announced they got, an overrun. By the way, another week where, well in advance, they announced an overrun. But they, but they didn't overrun. They got the match in. They got the match in, just the thing after it. Was there a thing after the match? <laughs> okay, I did not know that. Let's get to the match. All right, well, the, the main event match was Will Ostrich against Claudio Castagnoli. And a, another one of the new multi-million dollar acquisitions, the babyface who is a member of the top heel group is in this match wrestling another babyface in a group that wrestles like heels. So I hope we've, we've got that straight now. And again, I like Claudio's work. They've done nothing, you know, they've done nothing with him that anybody wanted to see. Let's put it that way with this group, the BBC or whatever. Um, I think Ostrich is my favorite of the new high-priced, you know, this year's models because O'Cody and Mercedes both suck so bad. It would almost be hard not to be, but he can do some shit. They started at 100 miles an hour. They did lots of stuff. They had good action. I kind of zoned out because, it, you know, the match is odd and again these groups that why are as we'll see in the finish why is ostrich still in this fucking thing maybe they're gonna do something but he beat claudio one two three and then hobbs and take a shit and felcher jumped in and attacked claudio and ostrich wouldn't help him but then suddenly Moxley's music plays. Here comes the plumber hobbling into the ring. And they get in a sloppy fight. And the last one in is Hobbs. And he kind of beats up Hobbs and bumps him out. And the heels stand there with Ostrich not happy. And the fucking plumber's already stood face to face with Hobbs and beat him up. So I don't know what the fuck to tell you. But was there something after this? Because that's where my DVR froze when everything was over with. There was. There was a confrontation between Samoa Joe and Swerve. Oh, good Lord. That's what I was confused, too. I'm like, they announced an overrun. I looked at when the main event started, the match. I said, why do they need an overrun? There's no way they're going to go that long with this. They didn't. They did an angle after the overrun. Hoping that people would tune in to see the major Hollywood blockbuster from 1996 that was in the time slot after their program went off the air. So on the go-home show, Samoa Joe got the better of Swerve Strickland after a brawl around ringside. So they just walked out there for no reason and started fighting. I don't. I think Swerve had the mic, and then uh, Joe... Well, you know Joe's going to have to do something about that. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's so dead right now. And there's a lot of people still denying everything. They've always been, but come on, it's so dead right now. The crowds die. The Let's Go Pocket chant is a bigger question. All the CM Punk chants last week. Another example. What fans are going to these shows? The crowds get lower. They drew 3,000 last time. It looks like this was under that. 
They never go up anywhere. Everything goes down. And let's see these ratings because they're they're not even a collector plate from the Franklin Mint because some of those plates do go up in value. I told you, I said just recently, and it wasn't even necessarily combined as a thought, two different thoughts, the overruns hurt them because people, things that need to be on the show and the body of the show aren't. And then the Joe Swerve thing is really cooled off. And I know they're still trying to do stuff, but I don't give a shit anymore. Who cares about the AEW World Championship right now? Well, they had the match first with Paige in the way. And that killed the anticipation of that they had going for Joe and Swerve. He got in the way, and you can't make a first impression twice. So now it's like, eh, we kind of seen that shit. Well, that was AEW Dynamite. Any final thoughts before we uh, time travel to the ratings? Hold on, let me get my seat belt here, and all right, I'm I'm gonna get strapped in. Oh, oh, hold on, I cranked it up too tight there. Maestro, I'm ready to get out of the ship now. We have come back to where we, uh, we actually know where we're forward from where we right were. Right back where we started from. Well, you could say that about some of these ratings, maybe, but AEW Dynamite ratings are in, Jim. All right, now hold on a second. There's two ways of looking at this. One, it has to be lower than last week because there was nothing on this program either advertised or that actually occurred that would make the AEW faithful's audience more salivatory their mouth water than seeing that security footage last week so there there was nothing this this so it has to be down or did seeing the flop footage last week caused this week to go down because it stunk so bad in the overall scheme of things? Or are they up this week because people didn't want to see that foolishness to begin with last week? I think it's got to be one of the first two, don't you? Well, Jim, the ratings... You know, so you don't have to think. I have it in front of me. And you got to remember, there was strong competition on this night. Very strong competition and... Another all-night gas station. I'm sure that after NBA... uh, After the NBA, excuse me, after NBA, the sting. After the NBA ends their season, the Dynamite ratings will shoot right back up. I just know it. They'll shoost right up through the sky. AEW Dynamite on TBS, Wednesday, April 17th, 2024, 8 to 10.09 p.m. So you missed nine minutes. Oh, boy. 762,000 viewers on average. Oh! What was last week? Eight? Last week was 8.19, down 7% from that. So, yeah, 38, 40, about 57,000 people. Well, that, that's just, that's... That's misfortunate. Where'd they start? They started with the Big Bang Theory. No, they started, and these were compiled by WrestleNomics, 8 to 8.15 p.m., John Moxley's live promo, Mercedes Monet's backstage promo, Willing, Willing, Willow <laughs> Nightingale. I bet she is willing. <laughs> Willow Nightingale. Only after a drink or two. <laughs> Her backstage angle leading into Adam Copeland and Nightingale versus Brody King and Julia Hart, 917,000 viewers. Okay, now to be fair, that is less than they've been starting with for the past few weeks, isn't it? Aren't they usually up in the higher nines coming off the Big Bang? It is below the trend. So right there, the Big Bangers let them down. However, almost hitting perfectly with the trend is quarter two. 8.15 8.15 to 8.30 p.m., the continuation of Copeland and Nightingale versus King and Hart with Picture in Picture, the post-match with Mercedes Monet, or Monet, and the sick head said that with a straight face. Money, 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 money! And Samoa Joe's backstage interview, followed by another ad break. 
865,000 viewers. Okay, so miraculously, possibly due to the popularity that Edge once possessed, they didn't lose their ass like they usually do from one to two. They only lost 35, 45, well, 52,000 people. Well, again, one's lower than normal, and two is about where two usually is. So we always say take the first quarter out of the equation because of the Big Bang Theory in terms of looking at the real number. Second quarter and the trend line kind of bears that out. There you go. Quarter three, Jim, 830 to 845. The Young Bucks backstage promo. Oh, boy. Leading into their big six-man tag match. The Young Bucks and Kazushka Okada versus Daniel Garcia, Pac, and Penta El Zero Miedo with picture-in-picture -picture ads. 725,000 viewers. Oh! Well, not only did they lose 140,000 people for their EVPs and their OCOD, but now by this, they can't continue to drop at anywhere near that pace, so they won't make their average. That indicates to me that a lot of people said, fuck it, I'm just turning this thing off as long as these jokers are on. Well, we go to quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. The Jokers match continues. The Elite versus Garcia, Pack and Penta. The post-match, an ad break, and the Chris Jericho hook live promo segment, or the start of it, 744,000 viewers. So 19,000 brave souls returned. Possibly when the all-clear notice was sounded. Well, the uh, all-clear notice may have been the 9 o'clock hour, 9 to 9, 15 p.m., the big 9 o'clock hour, quarter five. Jericho and Hook and Taz's live angle, Swerve Strickland's backstage interview, and Deanna Perrazzo versus Mariah May with picture-in-picture -picture ads. 748,000 viewers. So they got 4,000 more. They're only... 117,000 below quarter two now. They're cutting, They're making a comeback. Well, we now go to quarter... This is six. Six. Nine, it's, I always lose my place around the same quarter every show. 9.15, so 9.30 p.m. Perrazzo versus May continued with the post-match with Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm. The Bullet Club Gold backstage promo. An ad break. Billy Gunn and the Acclaims backstage promo. Yeah, I skipped though, all that stuff. And the start of Orange Cassidy versus Shane Taylor with picture in picture. Oh boy, this could be ugly. 685,000 viewers. Oh! So Tony's favorite son, his Halloween buddy and compadre mascot and favorite house pet. Sent them down another uh, 15, 40, 50, 63,000 people. Well, don't forget about the women's division. Well, and the, they, they'd they started the trend there, but they still had over seven. It wasn't until Pockets got in there full-fledged that they dropped below that. Well, we go now to quarter seven, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., the continuation of Pockets versus Taylor. With the post-match with Taylor Promotions, or Shane Taylor Promotions, Christopher Daniels, Matt, Matt Seidel, Trent Beretta. Oh, good lord. Yeah, you missed all that. The Roderick Strong video, an ad break, and the start of Will Ospreay versus Claudio Casignoli. 707,000 viewers. So, of all of his new high-priced acquisitions, the only one on this program that has shown their face and actually increased the numbers, even by 22,000 people, is Ostrich. 140,000 bailed for Okodi, and from the time that Monet was on first until she was on last was uh, 52,000 down. So, yay, Will! Well, that continues into quarter eight, and I remind you there's an overrun. 9.45 to 10 p.m., the continuation of Osprey versus Claudio with picture-in-picture -picture ads, and the post-match with the Don Callis family and John Moxley, 742,000 viewers. 
Well, there you go. He did. He did. Hold on here, my boy. <laughs> Wonderful Willie. He's the first one that has actually meant some movement of the needle in a positive direction. Well, we then go to the six minute overrun, although it said nine minutes before, but this is 10 to 10 06. Swerve Strickland's live promo and his angle with Samoa Joe. 665,000 viewers. Oh, Jesus Christ. What was what was on after my mother, the car? That not only was there nobody tuning in for the show afterwards, but they fuck it. Well, they probably like me. They said, fuck it. That's the end of the show. 42, 35, 70, 77,000 people. It usually goes up artificially. It went down. Ah. Taking out the first quarter and the overrun, the average is 745. And see, that's the thing now. They're still mostly in the pocket of what they always do. It's just that normally they would start strong and they would, lose steadily pretty much through the whole thing and end up at the at the bottom but now even their own faithful audience of 800,000 people every week that they've had forever is seeing some of these jack offs come on and go well fuck I, I can do something else for 15 minutes and so they're losing them well those are the ratings and again oh. uh they were apparently uh, they did the best on cable in the key demo, other than the NBA games that everyone must have been watching. But that's AEW Dynamite. But Jim, before we get out of here uh, and back uh, back to the drive through in the past, there is something that I see here on Twitter. Again, AEW had a media call earlier today with Tony Khan about, <sighs> what is it? Uh, not Revolution. Dynasty. Dynasty. I keep getting these pay-per-views because they all have the awful names. Here's Tony Khan answering Brandon Thurston's question about whether CM Punk paid for his own medical expenses related to the 2022 triceps injury. Because he said that in the Ariel Hawani interview. And what he said, I think his, his exact words also was he said he, he got his own doctor, he arranged for his own physical therapy, he did his own, it wasn't just that he paid for it, but he, he did it. He, he never heard from anyone in the of office that. about anything. Yeah. Let's go to this. I was wondering if you could clear up something that was raised by, uh, in Punk's interview a few weeks ago. He said that he personally paid for all of the medical expenses related to his 2022 triceps injury. I was wondering, if, can you say if there's any truth to that? And more broadly, is there a policy that AEW pays for medical expenses related to injuries that happen at AEW? We typically do pay those expenses. I'd have to look into that. Uh, I can't say for sure. It doesn't sound right to me if that is the case uh you know then i would reimburse them honestly i don't think that's i didn't think that was the case send in humana, your bills humana, humana. send in your bills punk he'll reimburse so, you. yes <laughs> but besides that how d if you're vince mcmahon when steve austin had his neck injury do you not know above anything else that's the one thing you paid for Hey, that punk interview was two weeks ago. AEW has been in reaction mode ever since on their TV but I, show. But I can understand there. not, you know, did they didn't fucking, look into this in the last two weeks, so he knows an answer? It, it, Angelico sprained his ankle. Did we pay for the doctor? I don't fucking know. That I understand. That's fine. CM Punk, your biggest fucking star with all of this goddamn publicity around everything. You haven't studied this case. All right. Well, let's finish the audio. It doesn't go too much longer. Case, and, and it doesn't sound right. Uh, so I would have to look into that. Um, you know, that's a good question, but doesn't, you know, typically we do cover those medical expenses, especially for something that occurred in the ring as that did. So I would have to look into that, but, uh, no, I'm not sure about that. I can't say for sure. That's well, really you know, interesting. He stressed that the injury happened in the ring. As that did. As that did. Very it, interesting. It couldn't possibly have happened in the skirmish that all the NDAs were signed about. It happened in the ring. Well, why didn't we pay for it? Well, that's a good question. Certainly, maybe we, I think we kind of, usually we, I'll get back to you. What the fuck is going on here? All right. They did their AEW ghosting thing. And what's the town going to do? Sit there and wait? 
And then he never asked what happened. And the interview came out two weeks ago. He never checked. Hey, is this true? He paid for all of his stuff after he got injured. And as you're saying here in your ring, although maybe punk saying I didn't get injured in the ring. So I paid for it. Interesting. Very or, interesting. Or maybe somebody in the legal department at the time just wanted to slow walk it or drop the ball or whatever because of their own personal affiliations. Who knows what might have happened at that point in time in that company? All right, Jim. Well, with that, we will now travel back to where we uh, started from. Let's go to let's go back there right now. <laughs> I don't know what kind of time machine this is. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back where we uh, started from. Uh, oh, hold on. Yeah, t that thing's giving me gas. Well, that seems Are you sure that, that, that helium that we're supposed to inhale isn't carbonated? You weren't supposed to inhale anything, so we will discuss later with uh, uh, well, you, Sergeant McCoy what, what you've I, been up to. That's what I, I thought we were supposed to inhale shit before we time traveled. Well, Jim, we are back, so we could, uh, I don't know where we're going. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great show so far. Why ruin it? This what, is the end of the show. Which, which one have you goddamn been fucking following? Great show so far. Well, Jim, what I meant to say is, how much money would you bet that this show will get better from here? And by the way, you can't even make that bet on their website, and we're discussing a different <laughs> thing they do, but... How much do you want to bet that we could somehow get DraftKings involved in this? Well, I'll tell you the thing. You don't have to worry about just one thing, better or worse, not on one note, because now you can pick six. It's the newest fantasy app from DraftKings, the, an official partner of the NBA. So if you're an NBA fan, listen up there, pally, because this is for you. Could the pick six thing, it's a fantasy app. And I was under the assumption, a fantasy app, there would be some element of touching oneself or self-pleasuring being involved, but I'm told that's not the case. You can actually, instead of costing you money, you can win money with this kind of self-pleasuring on the fantasy app. So what you do, it's very simple. You get started by downloading the new DraftKings Pick 6 app now using the code JCE. It's very important you use that code, or elsewise we may not get paid. And you take on the competition with your best NBA player picks, and here's what you do. You just, you decide if a player will have more or less of a stat. For example, will a player have more than one rebound? Or will a player have less than three and a half assists? And remember, we've questioned that half because how would you break that down properly? But nevertheless, if the player has less or more of these things than the average other guy or the average bear, why, and you, and you pick right or pick six, well, you're going to get money out of this some kind of way. Brian, they get paid in some fashion, right? If they win. You will certainly fashionably be paid if, yes. you, if you win. Yes. Because it said pick your favorite players and compete for huge cash prizes. A huge is huge. in capital letters. Come on, huge. Huge. They're just plain big. Overly preternaturally large. So anyway, if all this drivel sounds good to you and you know something about basketball, well, you go out there right now and you talk about these stats because it's quick. It's quick. It's like... Hand me the scalpel, stat. That's why they call it stat. Right? You've heard that e expression yes. before. Sorry, I had to close the window because someone's gardener showed up, so I had to... Well, uh, close the window, stat. I did, I just did stat. Stat. And download, download the new DraftKings Pick 6 app, fantasy app, stat. Stat. Using the code JCE, take on the competition, win huge cash prizes, Retire to a private island somewhere next to Bolivia with your own volcano and many topless dancing girls from the various islands wearing hey. flowers around their neck. All right. And 
The crown is yours, baby. With the new DraftKings Pick 6 app now using the code JCE and winning all these huge cash prizes. Huge. And what else do we have to tell the people? You tell me, Captain. No, when I say what else <laughs> do we have to tell the people, that might be your cue to hit that goddamn... Oh, oh we, we have... No, of course. Does this goddamn recording. We have a very highly paid voice actor who uh, comes yes. into the studios here and he records this. Hold on, let me... Uh, some fucking nut job. He drives a G wagon. Hold on, let me uh, get this here. Here he, here he is right now. Here he, here is he? his name. Here he, here he. Is. Call one eight hundred Gambler. Eighteen and over in most eligible states. Age varies by jurisdiction. Eligibility restrictions apply. Pick six not available in all states, including but not limited to Connecticut and New York. For up to date list of states, visit dkng.co slash pick six states. Void where prohibited. See terms at pick six slash promos. See, aren't you glad you're in New Jersey now? If you were in New York, you wouldn't be able to pick the six. Cause... No, that clearly summed it all up right there, I think. Yes. Well, DraftKings, once again, Jim, how can the uh, listeners use DraftKings? Uh, yeah, use the goddamn code JCE and then stay out, of, stay out of my business and get in your own. That seems like a good plan, Jim. Before we get going too much further, and I apologize for any Gardner noise in the background. Oh, for heaven's sake, it might be Earl Stanley Gardner, because it's a mystery where your noise is coming from. I have the lineup for AEW Dynasty in front of me, Jim. Oh, joy. I bet you're a happy man. Well, real quick, why don't we do a preview? We are going to be watching this, reviewing this. Dissecting this, Dissecting analyzing this. this. I'm thinking uh, of our recording schedule as I look at this, but Jim, let's go yeah, through the forensic lineup. examination of what went wrong and what the cause of death was. Jim, titles for titles, uh, and again, this is this Sunday live on titles for t isn't that like money for people? Or people are people, so why does it be titles for titles? Uh, hold on, this is very small. Can what I, the? Can I click this? Nothing happens if I click it. The AEW World Trios Champions, the Acclaimed, that's their title, versus the AEW World Six-Man. Oh, no, they're the Ring of Honor Six-Man versus AEW Six-Man. They're uh, merging the Six-Man, the Trios titles. Oh, after a Bullet long Club, last. Bullet Club Gold, the Bang Bang Gang versus the Acclaimed and Billy Gunn. Now, wait, how many people are involved here? Who is <laughs> the Bullet Club Gold Bang Bang Gang? That sounds like six, eight different people. Which three is it? So one of these teams is going to be walking around with two sets of belts now. There aren't enough belts and titles on this show. It is the Acclaimed and Billy Gunn versus Jay White and the Guns. Oh, so... but Gun for gun. This, so they're just going to declare one set of tag team, six-man tag team champions, so then... The Buckaroos and O'Cody only have to win one match to get all four or six belts or how many. All right. Well, then you get, um, the, you get to do the cool thing where you drape them around your neck crisscross, almost like a gun belt kind of thing. That's what I think everyone wants to do. The Bandoleros! That's right. That's right. Well, I... The, Buccari the Buccaratos, we can call them. <laughs> I would... You know where a pirate keeps his buccaneers? Where's that? Under his bucking hat. Well, Jim, speaking of bucking. So, well, wait a minute. Back to the, where are we going to prognosticate who's going to win this thing? The Acclaimed and Billy have got, well, all three of them are cooled way off, but the Acclaimed are colder than a banker's heart right now. But, uh, you know, does anybody care who wins these things? If Juice Robinson's anywhere near ready to return, I think then Bullet Club Gold will win. And yeah, and, I mean, I'm trying to think who it helps. Jay, if Jay White keeps losing, he means even less. No one's. I mean, eh. is this on the pre-show? It's live Hopefully. on. It's live on Twitter. This match. This is the only match where it's oh, live on Twitter. Live on Twitter. Well, live on hopefully. Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. Oh, well, I was going to say, hopefully it means nobody will see it. But between all of that and for free, probably more people will see that match than anything else on a pay-per-view. So, yeah, our condolences to both teams. E even, even whoever wins it will still be the worst for wear because of it. For the FTW Championship, the champion Hook versus Lionheart Chris Jericho 
the tree vortex or whatever he's calling himself now. Well, and uh, he wrestles like a tree. They're already advertising. (laughs) 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 Just bump off me. (laughs) Oh, now, come on, forever. Leave him alone. Hook just said the other night when Jericho was trying to talk him into trusting him and believing him and listening to him, everything he said, so he could tell him how to act and what to do. And he shoved down Taz. Hook snatched him and said, anytime, any place, anywhere. And now they're already, that was last night. It wasn't 24 hours ago as we sit here. So now they're already advertising that the, that's the anytime, any place, anywhere. Okay. All right. Do you have a prediction? <laughs> um, I think for this to go anywhere, Jericho has to fuck him in some kind of fashion, doesn't he? Well, I, I mean, beat him in a wrestling match in a, a cheating fashion. I don't mean actually have anal intercourse with him. Uh, I want to make sure nobody gets misconstrued there. But if if Hook beats him, Hook beat him before. If Hook beats him again, why would there be any reason to continue this? And why have Jericho win the FTW championship to have a feud with the FTW family themselves, Taz, who fell down after getting shoved, and Hook? <laughs> fell down after getting shot. I mean, seriously, what and was that? Hook, who was hospitalized by poisoned <laughs> potato chips. Yeah. All right. Well, Jim, we have another big match. What is a title match? Every match is a title match. Just Every about. match is a C more for your money. For the Continental Championship, the oh, Continental God. Champion, Kazushka Okada, versus the man who seems to be banned from this continent very often, Pac. <sighs> I, I mean, that's going to, we just saw the six man and it wasn't particularly impressive and we don't care about the title. They just made up. And this isn't even the continental title. Isn't the ring of honor title. Kingston still had Okada only won one of the three titles from Kingston is what we're hearing now. Right. I didn't hear. Is that what it is? Or he won I'm the- thinking that I'm thinking Kingston's still the ring of honor champion. And they say that whoever the triple crown champion is the, at the end of the year, they're going to still do another tournament. So you get to keep it till the end of the year. And then there's another tournament. That's great. And Okada got the, I don't know what the fuck. Why would anyone want to win that championship? If you're like a month away from the tournament. Well, you, that makes too much sense to think that. But point being, it's a title. It, again, another title. Nobody cares. Why the fuck would they? And O'Cody and our boy Pac are going to do a bunch of... Well, Pac's going to do a bunch of moves that the Outlaw fans like, and O'Cody's going to try to do as little as possible, apparently, to collect his check, because that's what he's been doing. I predict Okada will win. Well, I think that goes without saying. Jim, for the AEW World Tag Team Championship in a ladder match where the teams have to climb a ladder to grab a sign that says, I love Tony, the Young Bucks versus FTR. Uh, I Can we bet the farm on the buckaroos at this point? Because how the fuck would it, it, it... Now they've worked themselves in a position where before it was ridiculous for them to beat FTR completely ludicrous because FTR was so over. Well, now they've diminished FTR to the point where everybody expects them to fucking lose anyway, anything, not just against the buckaroos, but against anybody. And now they've got their brand new mega heel personalities that they have to push. So they will end up, and this will probably be the last FTR buckaroos match i would think so the people will have the memory that the buckaroos wanted and they added the ladder match just so that ftr can't show them up on the ground in the ring where they're so much better than the buckaroos instead they're going to make it a stunt show so the people are distracted by the fact that the buckaroos can't wrestle and then they'll be able to say that the two teams were even two two jim for the AEW International Championship. <laughs> Seriously, it's not even a rib. Every match is for some championship or other. It's like the fucking Blackjack Brawl. It's like the UWF. The champion, the international champion, 
Roderick Strong versus Kyle O'Reilly. I, I mean, this will probably be the best match on the show. Because they could both, I hope Kyle is recovered well. They could both work, but they've been made... In Roddy's case, he's a comedy preliminary figure. Spent a lot of time in a neck brace, a wheelchair. Kyle O'Reilly showed up looking like he just got out of a box car. And who cares? Who gives a shit? Nobody. It's just going to take up time. But who do you think will win the match? Oh, well, I mean, normally you would say since Kyle's coming back from a near career ending injury, there should have been an angle, there should have been some kind of interest. Instead, the match is just made, but why beat Kyle on his return when you've beaten Roddy since his debut? Why not beat him one more time? At least it might help Kyle. Did you see that Adam Cole's not coming to TV anymore because it was interfering with his healing of his, whatever it was, a broken foot from September or something? Well, I, I can believe I. Th- why you would put him on the road every week instead of in an intensive medical slash training slash dietary program, I have no idea to begin with because it can't just be a broken foot. There has to be more. He had the concussions before. Has that limited his ability to train? Um, him being on the road it really does nothing for anybody, which we knew when he was hurt. Why are they still going to make him the devil and make him the focus of all this stuff? Well, you can't, for the next however many months he's going to be out, just show up every week and be a crippled fucking manager. So, uh, no, I'm the only reason I'm surprised to hear that is that they finally figured out they need to do something to help him instead of fucking sending him out on the road every goddamn week in that condition. Well, Jim, not every match can be a title match. Some matches need to be that match where the lights go out and when they come back on, you've taken your bathroom break. The House of Black, in a trios match against Adam Copeland, Eddie Kingston, who has a belt in his photo, so maybe you're right, and Mark Briscoe. Poor Mark. I I, I mean, again, they're, they're pushing the House of Black. It makes sense for them to get a win over three random baby faces put together, but to put Edge on a team as a random baby face to Mark Briscoe, who again, for the last almost year and a half now, could have been one of their major singles baby faces. This is madness. Who do you think will win? I said the House of Black. House because of why Black. would you beat these? <sighs> uh, it, but I mean, none of these things make any sense. So they could do anything. But why would you beat the House of Black when they're in the middle of some level of promotional push as it happens in AEW just, you know, for this random team of no, of not nobodies, but the nobody that meshes with anybody else. Jim for the AEW women's world championship, the champion timeless Tony storm versus Thunder Rosa. Well, it's gotta be Tony storm because she's still got to contend with, this Mariah May uh, and whatever's going to happen with her. So Tony Storm is going to retain, and then... Will you watch that match? Because gimmick aside, those are actually two of the women wrestlers whose work you have admired in the past. Let's see how long this son of a bitch goes overall and, and how many of these other things I skip in disgust. Jim, for the AEW World Championship, the champion Samoa Joe... Versus Swerve Strickland. You know, if they don't pull the trigger on switching it to Swerve, then I don't think they ever should, but I think the time has passed where they should have. Because it... They got... The, it, if that last pay-per-view had been Swerve and Joe and Paige had not been involved, that would have been the perfect time. Put it on Swerve. It would have got Swerve over more. Joe could have... <laughs> done something heinous to him afterwards to necessitate a rematch. We could have still had a bunch of angles between them and blah, blah, blah coming up till now or whatever, but they gave him the match between Joe and Swerve. Page got in the way of it and diminished it. Swerve's time to win was then. They're, what, two months colder now than they were then? 
uh, I mean, I think Swerve will win it, but I don't know if it'll mean as much as it would have the first time around. The only way you get around Swerve winning it, and I'm not justifying this or saying I would, would be if Adam Page fucked him out of the title. We haven't talked about him. He hasn't been around. That'd be the only way around it, just because that thing is still out there. Well, but then you've got that thing is still out. That's right. That thing, that empty headed dipshit. Then you got to have Swerve and Page again. Do we want to see that shit? Does anybody want to see Page do anything again? The numbers say different. Hmm. Jim. What, there's more? There's more. How can there be more after the world title match? For the TBS championship. Oh, good Lord. The champion, Julia Hart. What? Versus Willow Nightingale. (sighs) Again, there was scuttlebutt that Julia may have been injured, may have not been. They kept her away from any contact of any kind appreciably on this past week's show. Maybe they think she can still make it. If not, they'll, I'm sure, do some kind of fucking angle. Uh, but I I would think that Julia would be re- retaining her belt as well at this point over, over Willow. And now we get to the main event, and Jim, I remind you, this is a... How, sim- wait a minute, how... We're, we're, we're still going after the world title match. Well, I'm just going in the order of the way they are on their website, on the official which, AEW which website. Which should be the official order, shouldn't it? You would think so. It made sense up to a point. But Jim, and again, I remind you, this is a Sunday night show beginning at 8 p.m. There's no way it's going to end before midnight, is there? Will Ospreay versus Brian Danielson. Oh, well, I mean, Osprey has to win again because he's the new acquisition, and that should be Danielson's mindset at this point within the last year, full-time year of his career or whatever, that he's going to put this guy over and make him the new greatest technical wrestler in the world. Hopefully they'll put that on like fourth or fifth because if they goddamn put it on last, they're going to go a long time because they're going to want to do a classic, a banger, and it will be better than most of what we're going to fucking see on the rest of this show. But if it's last and it's long and it's wrestling, eh, you know... Goddamn, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But hopefully it won't be last if it's long or it won't be long if it's last. Well, that is... Wait, is there, are there How many matches in total on the list there? As of now on this list, and again, one of them is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, so I don't know if that's a part of the main card. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And two of them are not for some kind of belt. And the Ladybugs play at the Ladybug Picnic. That's AEW Dynasty. What? If you were younger, you'd get the reference just a little bit. Oh, now you're knocking my goddamn age. All right. Well, Jim, speaking of your age and how things change over time, we've briefly talked in the past about some of the good things, but a lot of the fears around AI. And an example recently came into our news desk here. Oh, the the news desk over there. Is that the one to the right of you or the one to the left of you? Which is news and which is sports? Your father was a newspaper man, so I know you probably follow a lot of this stuff, but whether it's newspapers or, you know, just local news, jobs have been gutted. And unfortunately, now some of these jobs are being given to AI. AI is now writing some articles. Are you aware of this? Well, I've heard a lot about this, a lot of the scuttlebutt about it. At first, I thought it was some guy named Al. Every time I'd <laughs> see AI, like. <laughs> I'd say, some guy named, who the fuck is Al? And how is he getting away with all this shit? But apparently it's AI, and yet they're, they're trying to deep fake everything. They're trying to, but, but it, it sounds off. The discerning eye or ear can read it or hear it and see it. it to me, at least, I don't know, maybe I possess powers of coherency unbeknownst to mortal man, but I can tell. Well, this was the headline in Buffalo, WK. Wait a minute, in Buffalo, New York? Buffalo, New York, WK. All right, well, well for, for our international audience, you got to goddamn specify. WKBW, 
ABC Channel 7, Buffalo, New York. This is on their website. The headline... <laughs> oh, boy. The, <laughs> the headline... Wrestling Marks Rejoice! AEW is bringing dynamite and collision to Buffalo in June. <laughs> and then the... Uh, it says here... What will Booker of the Year runner-up Tony Khan have up his sleeves for the June 26th edition of Dynamite? Oh, my God. <laughs> Wait, they're getting now act- AI to write actual news pieces on the goddamn websites of the newspapers and television stations? Why pay a human when someone else could write a nice thing to the wrestling marks? Ask them to rejoice. Ah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> So that's an example of what's now happening, Jim. Any thoughts on this? And should the well, wrestling marks in the Buffalo area actually rejoice, or should it be a different reaction? I don't know. But here's the thing. We don't know that maybe that was Tony. That sounds like his writing style. And he's not artificial intelligence. He might not even be organic intelligence. So maybe he wrote <laughs> it that way. Maybe he is there. Hey, all of my fellow marks rejoice. And bow down to me and glorify me. Hallelujah. As the clouds spread and the sun comes down and I bestow upon you a night of rotten wrestling. Because I'm the booker. But I'm not the booker of the I was the booker of last year. That's the funny thing. It says booker of the year runner on Tony Khan. What will he have up his sleeves? <laughs> you better not pat him down. You may and, not like what it, you find. It didn't even it didn't even say 2022 Booker of the Year. It had his Booker of the Year runner up. Update his status. That's yeah, right. I, th- I think that was written by or somebody that they put on their staff. It sounds like somebody that they would hire in that company. Maybe somebody from the legal department. I understand they've they've switched a few of the legal the eagles in the legal department from one assignment to the other these days maybe they've they've switched around some of the legals now to writing the publicity well jim on that topic a lot of people have sent this over they wanted to get your thoughts on it an article from nbc news an exclusive by chloe mellis and alex sherman from cnbc vince mcmahon's life after wwe <laughs> kittens vacations <laughs> and staying in touch with Trump. The wrestling mogul is facing a federal investigation and accusations of sexual abuse, but some of those close to him say he's unfazed. WWE is moving on. Any initial thoughts on uh, Kitten's vacations and staying in touch with Trump? Well, I want to get to the details on the vacations and the kittens, but uh, we've heard this Trump business so many times that and I think they look at each other and they see each other in the mirror in, in a competitive fashion. And there's so many similarities in terms of their, you know, uh, the rules don't apply to us. Uh, from what we suspected all along, Trump was way ahead in criminality, which still he is in terms of actual crimes committed. But Vince in late in life has been trying to catch up with him there. But they've said that Trump will shoo other people out of the goddamn room when he when Vince is on the phone. And he made Linda a member of the cabinet. Okay, that she took that small business and built it. Oh, the fuck. Um well so uh, point being, I'm not surprised at that part. That part didn't surprise me at all. The vacations and the kittens and the puppies, I was dumbfounded. Scrolling down this article here, NBC and NBC News and CNBC talked to 11 people familiar with McMahon and WWE about how he's been spending his time and how the global brand he built over more than four decades is moving on without him. These people included close personal associates and company insiders. They declined to be named, citing ongoing legal cases and the confidential nature of internal corporate communications. So everyone's in other, scared. In other words, we don't want to have anything to do with Vince. We don't want to be mentioning his name in public, and we don't know anything. Multiple WWE insiders said that he hadn't had any contact with the company leaders and figureheads since he resigned. And figureheads. <laughs> since he resigned. <laughs> you never really see that. And figureheads since he resigned. Mark Shapiro 
the operating chief of WWE parent company. Sorry, I got distracted. Swami's barking. WWE parent company TKO Group Holdings said in March that McMahon doesn't work for the company, doesn't come into the office, and he's not coming back to the company. It's pretty definitive. That also means McMahon hasn't talked to his son-in-law. WWE creative chief and former superstar Paul Triple H Levesque or daughter Stephanie McMahon Levesque regarding company matters, sources said. See, now here, normally you would say bullshit, right? Because, okay, yeah, they're family members. They're wandering into each other's houses or whatever. They're not going to talk about, oh, shit, WrestleMania was great. Well, maybe they don't want to rub it in because he wasn't there. But in this case, I'm wondering, has anybody confirmed that Vince is talking to Triple H and Stephanie at all about anything? What is that relationship right now? We did see the personal trainer come out and make these comments. Someone who sees Vince every single week, if not more than one time, a few times a week, saying that everyone turned their back on him and people who he built up aren't there for him anymore. You have to wonder who he's talking about. I'm I'm just I would like to know if there's if they're pulling because I mean again it's like when Trump said, Oh yeah, if I'm elected, I'll let my kids run my but like those kids could run a fucking target. And he didn't he lied about that, like he's lied about everything else. But you would normally think that's what Vince would do, lie and he'd still be talking. But if they're personally on the outs because they're offended at this whole thing, and he did pretty much demote Triple H during heart trouble. He did. Stephanie resigned. Every time he'd come back, she'd leave again. He fucked with NXT. He fucked with NXT, so maybe some heat. So that would be interesting. I'd like to find out if they're speaking about the grandkids or the weather, but go ahead. While she introduced WWE's WrestleMania event earlier this month, McMahon Levesque who worked beside her father for more than 20 years and played roles in storylines, currently has no involvement with the company, according to people familiar with the matter. Levesque and McMahon Levesque declined the comment through a spokesperson, as did a WWE representative. That is interesting, too, the idea. She does have no role there. She's not a contracted performer that we know of right now. And they had her do the introduction. And coming out of it, she still has no role with the company. Well, I think it was to float her and at the Hall of Fame also was to, is, is that going to get any negative feedback? Are they going to light torches and carry pitchforks? And everybody was glad to see her, so then they let her do the welcome thing just to establish this is the good McMahon. She's a member of the Levesque family. This is the Triple H era. We're separating these people from the previous time she's now a guest and a family member of his rather than the billionaire princess. So I can see them doing that and made sense and it worked. McMahon is nonetheless indelibly linked with the wrestling outfit, which he bought from his father 42 years ago. Still, he seems to have moved on according to multiple sources. McMahon has kept up his other routines and it's as if he's unfazed by his legal fights, two sources said. For instance, on an afternoon in late March, McMahon returned on a private plane to the United States from the sunny Turks and Caicos Islands, <laughs> but he wasn't alone. According to a person close to him, he had with him seven kittens and a puppy, all of which he brought back to be adopted by his friends. This person added, here's a quote, if anything, he's enjoying life. The person also added that McMahon had taken a trip to Italy. Jessica <laughs> Rosenberg, an attorney for McMahon, declined the comment regarding the aspects of the former WWE chief's life reported in this article. She did criticize Grant's suit, and then she, uh, once again, McMahon's attorneys say that the lawsuit is false, defamatory, entirely without merit, and they're going to vigorously fight to defend Vince McMahon 
Vince McMahon, billionaire animal rescuer. What do you think, Jim? I am. That's where I'm. I'm at a loss for words because not only now remember when I knew Vince and worked with Vince, he didn't even fly in a private plane every great once in a while, if it was necessary. Right. <laughs> but otherwise he's going commercial. He was a regular old everyday millionaire, like all the rest of us. And, and then we hear he got the plane and we've heard about all the, you know, uh, misbehavior going on on the, the WWF planes and everything. But now he's got his own, like, little personal plane, doesn't even carry the boys around. He just goes around to fucking Turks and Caicos and the kittens and the puppy. I know there are stories, and I've heard about it, that Vince at one time had some kind of big dog back in the 80s. I guarantee goddamn to you, there was not a creature with fur on that property when I used to go see him. Because if there was, it would have saved me from cutting my throat many times. I would have been able to play with a fucking dog instead of brother love and shit stain. So there were no, <laughs> there was no fucking animals around at that point. I don't know that I've ever seen him pat a dog or pet a kitten. And then it just came back from Italy. This was a guy... And I mean, I'm glad to see he's enjoying life now that he's ruined a bunch of other people's. But <laughs> this was a guy, he had a $10 million mansion in Florida that he never even saw. They, the stories when I got up there in 93, 4, whatever, was that he used to go there for two weeks at Christmas with Linda, but he would work the whole time he was there. He'd just be on the phone or doing paperwork or whatever. And by the time the Attitude Era started, I think he cut it down to a week at Christmas and came back early. And then I think he sold the place in Florida. So this is not a guy that ever took a vacation. So the idea that he's just flitting around by himself, apparently, to Italy or to Turkey or Keiki or wherever the Turks fuck else he's going. Turks and Caicos. Well, Turkey and Keiki. Um, it's so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and coming back with a goddamn menagerie of Turkish and cakeish puppies and kittens. And, uh, did he? Did you he know, go customs? Isn't that illegal to bring animals into the country? Well, that's a question for uh, the authorities. I find the whole thing funny because the first trial, all of a sudden, he had the neck brace. Remember, he had the back surgery. Yeah, yeah. Now an article from a source close to him reveals that he's rescuing animals to adopt to his friends. What friends? Who's getting animals from Vince? When did this start? What is he, the North Shore yeah. Animal League? It, who's getting animals from Vince unless it's the donkey for the donkey show? Bruce. He expects you to be a part of it. Bruce, I tricked him. I told him I was getting kittens. I was really chasing pussy. Ah! This thing is ridiculous. Again, it's a source close to him. Was it his girlfriend? But but here but here's another thing now is that can't you get kittens closer than Turks and Caicos that you it might be easier to bring to adopt for I don't I don't know, but seven kittens yeah, he's, and a he's puppy. Gonna, he's going to go into court leading the kittens and the puppies and pushing some crippled children on on a goddamn roller. I'm hoping to pick up some frogs from the Galapagos Islands. Ah. <laughs> this is my new thing. I travel around the world and I get animals to sell to my rich friends. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I name the animals after my wrestlers. Uh, Steamboat, you need a new dragon? I got a hookup. <laughs> <laughs> here he is, ladies and gentlemen, Ricky Komodo. Let me go back to the article here. Life amid litigation. The details of McMahon's life after his WWE reign present a stark contrast to Grant's accusations, which paint a graphic portrait of a violent and controlling man. In the federal lawsuit, filed January 25th, Grant's attorney said that she was the, and this is a quote, the victim of physical and emotional abuse, sexual assault, and trafficking at WWE, naming McMahon and former WWE executive John Laurinaitis. Both men have denied the accusations in the suit. 
The lawsuit also named WWE as a defendant. Uh, through their parent company, they take the allegations very seriously. Well, hold on. This is just this is all stuff we've read. I'm trying to find anything new about Vince. Oh, I, I, when I perused the article, it did here mention he was still doing his bi-weekly haircut. Uh, well, it says here, federal investigators seized a phone from McMahon and have been trying to determine whether federal law was broken in the conduct surrounding Grant's allegations. He's cooperating with authorities, according to people close to him, and he believes the officials won't bring any charges against him and that Grant's civil case will be settled out of court said a person close to the former wrestling executive. That's interesting. That Why wouldn't he think that? He's gotten away with almost everything else he's ever done through his life. Why wouldn't he think that? He could just throw as much money as humanly possible. At this point, he's got billions in cash. He, he, he's got coming up on $2 billion, and you know maybe that's what he's thinking. A spokesman for Grant's attorney said that there have been no settlement talks with McMahon, and a spokesperson for the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York declined to comment. While his legal battles persist, McMahon is often ferried by a private driver from his posh Connecticut home to Manhattan, according to one of the sources close to him. There, he eats with friends at restaurants, such as the old-school Italian spot Il Tanello East on 46th Street. He sees his longtime barber for bi weekly haircuts. Boom! And works with his personal trainer multiple times a week, the source said. Yeah, well, we know that to be true. Also, he. Remember, I've told you it used to be once a week, as a matter of fact, I think. He would have his limo driver and he would go through this to get a fucking haircut. Get in a goddamn limousine in Stamford. And drive all the way into New York City in that traffic, take hour, hour and a half, whatever, to get a fucking haircut, tip the fucking guy $100, get back in the limo. It was a four-hour round trip to get a fucking haircut. It cost him $100 plus the haircut. Plus tip. Well, no, the $100 tip plus the haircut. Oh, yeah, that, that's right, that's right. Yes. Uh, two other sources... Yeah, he may have tipped on the tip, I don't know. Two other sources, however, say McMahon has otherwise been quite guarded, and that's a quote, and often on the phone with his lawyers to map out plans since Grant's lawsuit was made public. I'm trying to just see whose gardener this is making all the noise. Do you hear that? Can you hear it? It's like a helicopter. No, no, I hear nothing. I hear well, nothing. It's the voices in your head. Well, let's speak about the voices in Vince McMahon's head and what he hears. Staying in touch, McMahon has also talked to Trump According to two of the people close to the wrestling impresario, the two billionaires have been in touch regularly, according to a person close to McMahon, although it isn't clear what they've discussed. Trump and what? McMahon... <laughs> Hold on here now, because remember we've talked about this. Vince was envious of Trump in the past because Trump's plane was bigger, and he had Trump Tower. The tower is bigger than Titan Tower or whatever the fuck, but now... Vince has got more money than Trump because Trump tried to do a cast media fucking podcast one type of deal and scam a bunch of people out of money. But he his dropped like a turd in a punch bowl also, this true social bullshit, Twitter for fucking right-wing racist lunatics. Donald, so, you got so Judge Mershon, me too, me too. There you go. Now Vince has $2 billion in cash and Trump isn't worth jack shit on paper by the time that they get finished sorting through how he's misrepresented his finances. So maybe Vince is, is giving some advice to old Donnie Dip shit over there. Uh, scrolling down a little bit, another person close to McMahon said that the two men don't discuss their legal problems and that Trump doesn't provide legal advice. <laughs> a representative for Trump declined the comment. That'd be safe for both parties involved, for neither one of these motherfuckers to provide the other with legal advice. Since he resigned, McMahon has been in touch with Dwayne The Rock Johnson and John Cena, sources said. Johnson and Cena, both Hollywood superstars, are two of WWE's biggest success stories. And then it goes into some public quotes that were made. What do you think about the fact that they are staying in touch with Vince? 
Well, now, it didn't say they're staying in touch like, oh, we got to, you know, text Vince this afternoon. We'll get together for lunch. He has talked to them because, and you you know Vince. The, the, the mind that is set that he has, these are the last two guys, or two of the last guys. I'm sure he's talked to Taker, too. But these are two of the last guys that he took from from scratch and made the biggest stars in the business. He didn't even do that with Hogan. Hogan was already big. So they're going to be grateful and or beholden to him to some extent. And also they're going to be two on the very short list of guys that he would reach out to. It didn't say who had called who. I don't know if, uh, if they just, you know, said, hey, Vince, we're hoping everything comes out okay, or whether he reached out to them to say it was bullshit or whatever. But I can believe that he would be talking to those guys uh, at some point, even if it wasn't regular, and I would believe they would talk to him. Well, Jim, a few more things here as I scroll down. And again, this is from NBCNews.com, if anyone wants to read it or look at a couple of pictures. Otherwise... WWE is more relaxed since McMahon resigned in January, sources said. When McMahon was still running things, he would come in late in the afternoon and often stay until around midnight or beyond. See that again. That is completely reversed behavior from what, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there were days he stayed late at night at the office, but he was... Unless he was doing business somewhere else, he was in the goddamn office before everybody, practically, you know, before anybody but Finkel, early in the morning. And if if you were, if we were writing at his house, you said nine o'clock in the morning. Don't care what time you got to leave your home to be here. The idea that somebody would have said, "Oh, if you called the office, oh, it's only." 2.30 in the afternoon, Vince isn't here yet, and that would be a normal thing. That's fucking odd. And on the other end of it, yes, he'd stay till everybody else was sick and tired and fed up with him. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. But fucking midnight, unless there was a shoot at the studio or something, that was that didn't happen. So what the fuck did he start doing? Was he sleeping until noon because he was up till 4 in the morning? What? Well, he didn't never sleep that much anyway. I'm just, how did he suddenly reverse his schedule as he got that old in life to go the other way and stay up late instead of getting up early? His office at WWE headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut is unoccupied, but otherwise intact, according to an executive who called it spooky. You you get the impression it's like the fucking Norman Bates's house with the goddamn impression of his mother's body in the goddamn mattress. Left intact, so the the big dinosaur skull is there, and yeah, who's who's gonna take it down? I guess he had a reputation for being capricious and quick to fire employees, which generated fear and created a chilling effect, according to sources. Now there's more levity and freedom to make a mistake or suggest an idea, some employees said. Yeah, but the thing is, they're fucking, uh, the new ownership is firing people left and right now, aren't they? The current leadership operates more conventionally. Normally? Is what the, how they operate, more normally. More normally, giving underperforming employees a standard progress report and opportunities to improve before taking action, they added. Some oh, guy, so you, you better get your shit straight or else we're going to put our foot up your ass is what they're saying. Some McMahon loyalists remain. <coughs> Bruce Pritchard. <coughs> but, one, <laughs> but one employee said, and this is a quote, WWE is actually a really great place to work. And Vince distracted from that. It's been much better since he left. Another said, People feel like they're on steadier ground. The company, meanwhile, is charting its post-McMahon course with the help of lucrative media rights deals, and then it goes into the amazing success that they've had since Vince left and him selling the stock. What do you think of this story? Obviously, some of it came from directly from the McMahon camp for a reason, for positive PR. <laughs> he's getting accused of rape by one side, and he's saying he's rescuing animals 
on islands across the world on the other side. What well, now, but, but he, nobody, did, the, the word rescue was not mentioned. He brought back seven kittens and a puppy to give to his friends to adopt. And was he on the beach rounding up these stray, potentially diseased felines, or did he buy them down there and he's brought them back? Like the fucking Grinch at Christmas, I'll take your tree there and then bring it back here. Can you imagine Trump clears the room? It's Vince. He must have something important. He's got kittens. Vince, what's going on? I need you to take a cat. What? (laughs) (laughs) No, little pussy's got me in enough trouble. But, uh, (laughs) but uh, so the point being, uh, there's not that many people close to, close to Vince, as we've talked about. So you're right. Some of the people that would be that close to know what he's doing are trying to make him sound better than he is, but or maybe better than people's perception of him is what I'm trying to say. But it's the same time the fucking anybody making an official statement about the company is like, no, he hasn't, he doesn't come in here. We don't talk to him. He has nothing to do with us. We don't even know where he is. And that's, you know, got to be hard for him to take at this point. I'm, I'm pretty sure he probably does believe, no, nah, they're never got anything on me. And I, I, cause he's invincible in his mind and usually it works out that way. So he's probably not as worried as most people would be, but he can't be happy because unless he's just decided, fuck it. Cause I got my $2 billion and I can swim in it. You know, he's taking vacations or whatever. Cause he's got nothing else to do that he wants to do, but you never thought of an end game with him. You just thought he wanted to stay there until the end. And that's what it was. That's he never thought otherwise. And and now I'm thinking that he's the, he's got 2 billion dollars and plenty of fucking time to get even with some people. So I'm still keeping an eye on that. But it's good that he's doing work for the the puppies and the and the kitties. Well, Jim Vince McMahon may be coming off a private plane with a box filled with seven kittens and a puppy, but the listeners can get a box of awesome delivered right to their front door. How about that? That's right. From our friends at Bespoke Post, you can get your box of awesome delivered right to your front door by the United States Postal Service, or I don't know if it's UPS or FX or whoever else delivers things, but you'll get a box. And in it, on your front porch or in your mail receptacle every month, will be awesomeness, the likes of which you very rarely see in this environment in these modern times. But, And I'll tell you, if you you see holes punched in the side of that box, that means it's a puppy or a kitten. Because that's federal law. They have to punch at least four holes in the side of the box before they can deliver a full-sized living organism. But regardless of whether your box of awesome has holes in it or not, and Brian, you're not going to disagree with that, so I'll just move right along. If you want to get started with a, are you No, don't there? do that. Don't. I, no. I, you know, I got distracted, so I don't know exactly <laughs> what you did, but I'm sure it was awful. No, that's not how it works. Don't. No, no, no. Don't do what he said. Just use the promo code that he said. I didn't say it yet. Don't say I'll it. Take- don't. No, don't say it. Don't. What you can do to get started with our friends at boxofawesome.com is take their quiz because your answers and what you're interested in and the things you like and enjoy and things you might want to stay away from are the way that they pick the boxes of awesomeness to send to you. They release new items every month across a ton of different categories. And when you become a member, you're going to have access to stellar discounts across a plethora of products, maybe 30% off or even more sometimes. You know, and also you you could get, it's just, it's wonderful when you open it up and the smile that comes to your face because you know you're getting awesome, but you don't know exactly what awesome you're getting. We've gotten fine quality cocktail glasses. We've gotten cocktail kits and silver shakers, barbecue items. I got a box of socks the other day. Not just socks, what? but custom made socks. Really? I'll have, I put one on my face. I look just like Excalibur and fun, You never know what you're going to get because it's different for everybody based on what you're interested in. But 
of everything that comes in your box of awesome is from a small up and coming brand, a mom and pop type of shop. They go around and they curate and confiscate these things from mom and pop and grandma and grandpa. Then they sell them at a discount and pass the savings on to you from ripping off poor grandma and grandpa who are working their fingers to the bone in a slave shop somewhere or a sweatshop or chain the bowels of a slave ship. A sweatshop, I believe, is the uh, term for this awful environment. And folks, right now you can get a free mystery gift with your first monthly shipment when you sign up at boxofawesome.com and enter the code JCE at checkout. Now, see, if you just go to boxofawesome.com and you just sign up like you're a normal mark walking in off the street and don't use the code JCE, you don't get your free mystery gift. And this free mystery gift, it's guaranteed that you will look at this thing and you will not have a fucking clue what it is. It is a complete mystery. It's like the the amazing, stupefying it. You don't know what it is, but it's wonderful to look at and amazing to know. So right now, go to Box of Oz. Did you ever go to the carnival and see the amazing, stupefying it? Or the amazing thing, which, whichever it was billed as? No, they didn't have that at the car. Usually the carnivals were around like the churches in Long Island and they had. Oh, uh, fuck. You can't have a carnival Zeppelis. next to a church. You can get Zeppelis. It's... You can get a good sausage and pepper sandwich. No, if you have a good carnival next to a good church, that's like matter meeting antimatter. It'll fucking blow up. You didn't get to see the five-legged cow and the two-headed sheep. <laughs> they didn't have that the, at the church, no. The world's fattest man. He may have been there. But it was an unofficial well, appearance. It was an unofficial <laughs> appearance. He was just hanging out rather than actually advertised. And the 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 amazing it or whatever is the thing in the jar, and you look at it, and you they say, "What is it? Is it some type of fetus that was aborted? Is it an embryonic animal of some description? Is it a space alien? We uh, there's eyeballs over here and fucking bladders over there. We don't know what it is. Once again, these carnivals on Long Island were typically at churches. In Brooklyn and Queens, too, the carnivals I went there were at churches, too. Or around well, then, then I bet they didn't like the skimpy outfit on the Siamese twin girls, or much less the bearded lady, because her beard was all the way down to her crotch, and churches don't like crotches. But folks, regardless of what it is, you'll get it. From boxofawesome.com, a free mystery gift with your first monthly shipment when you sign up using the code JCE at checkout. And again, awesome items and mementos and memorabilia and features and things delivered right to your door in a box of awesome every month. This is only the mystery gift that we're talking about now because it's gift enough that you're getting these fine products at an amazing discount. And you open that box up and you just say, boy, howdy, anything that comes out of a box gets over. Boxofawesome.com. Dot com with the promo code JCE. What's that promo code again, Brian? JCE. Yeah, how do you like it when I do it? Well, Jim, let's go from Box of Awesome to WWE Raw, which tell me what you think, but seems to be kind of slowly getting back to where it was. <laughs> In terms of, I mean, the production looks incredible and the pacing. There are lots of things that are better, but this was one of those weeks where not a lot really seemed to matter. Well, there wasn't, there wasn't, there was still things going on, but it slowed down on the star power. We, we didn't have, we didn't have The Rock, we didn't have Roman, we didn't have Logan Paul, we didn't have a variety of these big names, but we were in Montreal. Go ahead. They I'm were sorry. all filing their taxes. Yes, because it was April 15th, tax day here in America. A day for rejoicing that you live another year. But was this the the end of the sellout streak? They were in Montreal, the Bell Center. They said jam-packed. They said over 15,000 people. They never said sold out. They didn't put the graphic up. I think they came, came, a, cup, came a couple. They came <laughs> a couple short is what they did. Uh, yeah, they did. I think they did definitely cape a couple here. But SmackDown sellout streak is intact. Well, yeah, but it was all TV sellouts at one point. Well, it now, was Now they can say SmackDown sellouts, and eventually it'll just be NXT sellouts. I don't know if we're going to have a lot of those, but anyway, the big news that everybody wanted to know what we thought about, they started off the top of the program on Raw 
Rhea Ripley. This is the dumbest fucking... <sighs> ah, she's hurt. She's going to be out. She had her arm in a sling. She relinquished the women's title. And of all the things, they have these matches where they do all this dangerous, death-defying shit in the ring. And she got hurt in a backstage angle, getting her shoulder run into the wall. And somebody on Twitter said, well, of all the people to do it, Liv Morgan, I agree, of all the people to be involved with while you do it, it had to be her. Liv Morgan is completely useless. But it, it wasn't Liv Morgan hurting her. She ran... <laughs> If you're someone is running you into the wall, unless they're really fucking stupid, they're not really running you into the wall. You're running your own self into the wall. And it was a, apparently a freak thing. She must have hit the point of her shoulder again, or whatever the fuck against the wall because, what is it, the AC joint is out? I believe that's the correct, yeah. Well, ha, so here we go. So now she's gone, and that's uh, pretty much going to nullify my interest in the women's division over here now for the next few months. But it, just a stupid thing. Why, again, having her involved with Liv Morgan, whatever this goddamn fascination is they have with this Liv Morgan that anybody could buy, that she's going to be a badass or kick the shit out of anybody. She looks like a fucking Barbie doll next to a goddamn... Rhea Ripley looking like a goddess and they got to do an angle in the hallway and she's got to run her shoulder into the wall. She's got to accidentally fuck herself up. So she had fire and emotion in her promo. And she said, when she coming, when she comes back, she's coming back for blood. And that got a big pop. And then Liv came out and security kept them separated. And they go to the back and judgment day, give her a hug and, Damien Priest gives her a pep talk, and then Rhea tells him to take care of Dominic, and she walks off into the fucking sunset. I'm highly fucking dismayed and pissed over this. <sighs> I'm, I'm pretty pissed right now, too. My gardener just showed up. He's not oh, supposed to be here on this day. But you will hear him now, because this is my guy who lied. Was he going to be and, here and on this day? And who's louder than the other people's guy? Well, he'll be right outside my window. He'll be out. Outside well, the office not, window here. Now that you've seen him, can you get a bead on him from outside the window? Well, Jim, teach him. Do you, are you being unfair to Liv Morgan? It could have been anyone in that role. I mean, like you said, Liv and uh, Rhea threw herself into the thing. Well, but it had to be her that who would give a shit to see that anyway? Rhea's twice as big as her. Rhea Ripley takes pills bigger than her, and she is uh, between her and Alexa Bliss on who can do the. The most shit that would kill a normal human being and, and a hundred pound blonde get up unscathed. I'm fucking sick of it. But what were you going to say? No, that was kind of it. Uh, you know, sad to see Rhea Ripley out. Obviously affects Judgment Day. Uh, but that was another segment, I guess, right after this. Well, anyway, so then we get to the rest of the program. Seamus is back. He's been out for a while. I don't recall us missing him, but he's back now. And he beat Ivan the Viking. Can't, uh, Drew McIntyre has completely remade himself, and we love him now, his personality, his promos, his matches. Well, mostly personality and promos, but the matches. Can Seamus do it? Or is he going to be pale and fishy white and boring for the rest of his life? Got odds on that? You know, he's been there a very long time. I know he's been injured, but he's been there a long time. I'm not excited about his return. But let's see what they do. All, well, they, can, he, all they can do is make me excited. It can't get any worse. <laughs> it can't get any more disinteresting. The package they did on Sammy beating Gunther for the Intercontinental title. I'm sad it had to happen, but since it did... Is that the NFL Films voiceover guy? W did you hear this? Was that the actual... That's the voice, right? It may have been. I wasn't paying attention. This was great. You missed something you should have seen. This was great. This seems to be the new television production chief, the new 
TV production outlook and the UFC influence in making these videos where even though this was a it's it's a work it looked like a goddamn sporting video about a guy fulfilling a quest for a championship. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And it would talked about also with his help that he got from Chad Gable now in tonight's intercontinental title match against Chad and the comments and the music and the whole thing. This was great work and it's more, it's more serious. It's more professional than, and, and I've always said that WWE does good packages. I've always put their studio over and the production people they had underneath Kevin Dunn when you would... Larry, you, you know who Dave Sahadi is. David Sahadi yeah. was... When they started doing the cold opens with the, the dramatic voiceovers and the really artfully done video packages back in the 90s Attitude Era for all the big pay-per-views, that was Dave Sahadi. He was writing them. He was supervising the editing. And then, of course, Kevin Dunn made him feel so disrespected and unappreciated that he left and went to TNA and did the same thing there for the middle, late 2000s. A very creative guy. But the point is, they would get guys in the studio, the young video editors and the technicians and whatever, they could do good shit when you basically left them alone and had them come up with something. And then... They could show it and run it by Kevin and he'd bless it or whatever and take credit for it. But that's been a strong point of their operation. But now that they're getting these shots live, because where Kevin Dunn was in charge was the overall look of the production and the television show live. Now they're getting younger and more experienced people and more professional people at the top so that they have the the pieces to work with on doing stuff like this. And that's what Kevin Dunn, as we've talked about, worked for one company in television production for one company his entire life from the time he was a teenager. So what great jarring revelations in television in between 1984 and 2024 was he on the cutting edge of, right? And so now they've replaced that. And uh, anyway, I think that was a piece of work. You ought to go out of your way to try to see that, as the kids say. The new style of videos they're doing. And then they went back to the old style shit. Did you watch the... Uh, Triple H came to the ring with Adam Pierce, and I thought, we're going to see something here. And then Triple H says at WrestleMania, a new era started. Uh, we're going to see something here. And then Adam Pierce says, we have two tag team champions, which now we're starting to not make any sense again. And they deserve titles they can be proud of. And I thought, why wouldn't they be proud of winning the titles? And then, I, oh, he means belts. They're gonna, they got new belts they're going to give out. And then here comes Miz and R-Truth, and automatically I didn't care because I know where this is going. And they gave them new, better-looking world tag team title belts, not raw tag team title belts. And then Truth did his stuff that's supposed to be funny, and I skipped this whole goddamn rest of this thing. And they went right into the three-way for the number one contender for the tag team title with the Creeds and Champa and Same Face and the New Day. But... Did you have any comments on this interview and presentation before I move on? Yeah, and the guy's driving around on his fucking lawnmower right behind Oh, me. boy. Well, I'm telling you, get the slingshot out. Knock him right off that seat. No, that's the window that's closed. Um, did I have any more thoughts on this? They're going to burn out people being excited about Triple H appearances if they don't make them special. Yeah. New tag belts are cool, I guess. I don't really think they're that good looking. They just go back to the old design from the 80s. It's my opinion. Well, these look better than those silver hubcaps they did have. That's true. If you're into the Triple H, not Triple H, if you're into the R-Truth comedy, it was entertaining watching him interact with Triple H. If you're not into that and don't find it cute, you probably didn't have a lot of time for this segment. If, 
like you said, they they need to keep Triple H more special than coming out to give tag team belts to mid card guys. Pierce could have um, done this. Pierce could have done it just fine, or as as Michael Cole called him, the middle management stooge. Um, and and they they have t they had a match where they ended up with two winners of a goddamn wrestling match for the first time apparently in history that had won two different titles. So they split the belts up again. And that's just belts, 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 belts everywhere. And while they're saying that this is the strongest tag team division ever, Miz and R-Truth are champions of one show. The Creed's Champa and Same Face and New Day are having a triple threat match. That's the goddamn strongest tag team roster ever. Fucking Christ on a cracker. And they went, they, Tommaso and Goofball won the three way that went across the nine o'clock hour. So these are uh, all the tag teams are just underneath, kind of maybe middle, and there's multiple champions, and nobody's going to care. That's just my thought. Speaking of not caring, would you like to know what the next match was? Sure. Indy Hartwell and Candy LeRae against Model Girl and Nivy Isle, or Nivy Isle, or Ivy Nile. One of those. Is it LaRue or LeRae? I can't remember. Candice, I think it's LeRae. I think it's LeRae. So there was a nice package on Damian Priest. That's what she said, Doctor. Ten years ago, he was homeless and apparently fat, too, from the pictures. He's fat. He's fat. And what a transformation. He looked really outlawed in these old pictures, but now he looks good, and they had commercial music. They credited the artist. I've never heard of her, so she's obviously contemporary. But a great music video. This is the push that we thought that they would be giving him a while back, but they got distracted, and it might have been better to push him at that point instead of now. But at least they're finally doing it. But another good... Vi the, the videos were the best thing on this program last Monday night. Did you skip that too? No, I did see it. It is pretty, you know, glaring when you see what he looked like 10 years ago. It's like another human being. Anyone could do it. Between him and Gunther, these guys who looked like they were naturally bigger guys got into great shape. Anyone could do it. You hear the gardener? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, if I was you, I, I, we're going to get a lot of complaints about that garden. Yeah, I'm here I, live I, from the Mekong Delta. You may hear I, some of the things happening in the background. I'd fire him if I were you, because people are going to quit, quit listening to the show now because of that. Will they hear it this time? Is this loud enough? Well, yeah, because what you're doing is you've got a goddamn electric razor at a bathtub, and you're, you're fucking next to the bathroom so that we think... That we can finally hear this fucking fictitious gardener. And now I can't hear anything. He's driving away. I, I muted myself yeah. for a moment to rescue everyone, and now he's driving away. Anyway, so earlier in that day, Jackie Redmond interviewed Chad Gable and about his match with Sammy tonight for the Intercontinental title. He was very babyface and well-spoken, articulate. And he raised the point that he knows Sammy's weaknesses from training him and training with him all this time. And this was good, but I also came away with it. Jackie Redmond is the best female interviewer in the business. She's actually the only one that ought to be in, involved in it. Because she actually sounds like a sideline sports reporter instead of, of, you know, some girl standing up on fucking camera reciting a memorized question in a worked situation to get a memorized answer. Do you get that vibe from old Jackie? I think she's really good. Again, she's the one I like because she just calls Michael Cole Cole, which I find funny. She's talented. Obviously, she's done other things. I want to say someone said she did hockey, or maybe it was... I don't know what it was, but she's... Oh, boy! If she played hockey and still came out that pretty, she must have been really fucking good. As a commentator, that's only if she's Canadian. That would be the case. But uh, she's really good, and I think also this is an example of the difference in the way they treat commentators under Vince and Kevin Dunn and under Lee Fitting. 
They treat them as serious entities that you got to, they may be pretty, but they're not asking bubble-headed questions. You bubble-headed booby. Oh, oh so, dear. Speaking of boobies, no, a girls' match wasn't next. God damn it. What a great transition that would have been. It was Andre versus Dominic Mysterio. In this long-running feud that they've got going on, J.D. Uh, Funko tried to help, but Andre nailed him and then hit his finish on Dominic 1-2-3. They can always beat Dominic. He's going to have heat regardless. But then the heels get back on Andre, and suddenly here comes Rick O'Shea. And he saved the day, and the heels powdered. And and the entire O'Shea family should be proud of him. Uh, did you notice that Cody Rhodes is now doing a spot plugging the wrestler in the Olympics for NBC as cross-promotion? I saw that. That was kind of neat. Cody's got a little amateur background also. But that's, uh, again, in... <laughs> In what universe, if if the Olympics was on TBS, in what universe can you see John Moxley or whoever being asked to do a network goddamn commercial for the Olympics plugging the amateur wrestler from the United States? I think not. And then we got Piper and Chelsea against Caden and Katana. And then Liv Morgan was in the back, and I'm like, is this wow or glow or what the fuck? Just girls, girls, girls. Girls, girls, girls. And she's confused why people are mad at her, because when she got hurt before, blah, blah, blah. Well, the reason they're mad at you is because Rhea Ripley's a superstar, and we blame you. So shut the fuck up. So finally... At 9.57 p.m., we get Cody's entrance. I wrote, finally, finally some star power here. And it was perfect. He was in the ring at 10 o'clock for Cole to do the still to comes. And they had the graphics right at 10 o'clock when people are switching around or whatever the fuck they're doing. <clears throat> they land on the ring where the biggest star in the company, the champion, is in the ring, and Michael Cole is announcing their main event with graphics on it. Perfect timing. And the crowd olayed him. Ole, 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 ole. Now, I thought that was Spanish. Is that French? Because they're in Montreal. I don't know. Every time they do it, I don't know where it comes from. They used to do it for Jose Reyes on the Mets. I don't know. It's a soccer thing, I think other people have said. I don't know. Well, now, soccer isn't Spanish as much as it is European, right? Right. But what does that have to do with the French people? I and why then, if it's about a soccer deal... Do you ever think maybe it was a tribute to Ole Anderson? Well, why does the bullfighter say ole? Ole, ole, ole. He doesn't sing the song, I don't think, to the bull. Well, I thought that's how they called it. I don't know if you're necessarily down. an expert in bullfighting, uh, Mr. Hemingway. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, no, I thought that music has the charms to soothe the savage beast. I thought they sung ole, ole, ole to calm the bull down so they could fucking skewer him. Well. Anyway. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they olayed him. And they chanted Cody. And then he asked them what they wanted to talk about in French. He said, parlez-vous, oui, oui. And they pissed right over, all over him. And he's going to face either L.A. Knight or A.J. Styles in France coming up. And I think we know what that's going to be, unfortunately, uh, because we don't want to see L.A. Knight do a job, but we don't want to see L.A. Knight versus Cody. And he thanks Seth watching at home, and then the crowd said, thank you, Seth. And then he started talking about The Rock. And Brian, would they be talking this much about a match that they don't ever plan on having? They're setting up next year's WrestleMania, I think. And the, the gift, apparently, that was passed and then hand to put in the hand and the blah, 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 was the watch that, Co that Dusty pawned a long time ago to send Cody to wrestling school or whatever that story was. And in the press conference after WrestleMania, he said he got it from, I think, Triple H and Bruce and Nick Khan. 
Well, it's, uh, this watch is being passed around like an old whore. But anyway, Cody said if he was going to bleed, then The Rock is going to bleed with him. And then he brought up Tama Tonga joining the bloodline. He said, we got questions about the bloodline. Here's who we got to talk to. And he brought out main event Jey Uso. They are going to try to push him, Jey Uso being him, as the guy on Raw, apparently. And how the fuck well do you think that's going to work from what we've seen over the past few weeks? I don't know about that. Yeah. Cody put Jay over and he offered to watch his back tonight. But Jay, I, got, I said, I got to do it on my own because I'm the yeet master, Mr. Yeet down. He started gesturing to the fans now when he wants them to say yeet. This is going to get old, and it already is, and it's going to backfire on him. The ridiculous rot, rock, rot. The ridiculous rock hot dogging on the fucking punches and the spit punch and the slap punch and the insistence on conducting the crowd with the facial or the arm gestures whenever he says yeet. He ain't that over. And I think he's he's... I think he's miffing some people a little bit with doing that because it's too much. Let them do it, but don't tell them when they got to do it. L.A. Knight came up with that actually as a heel, remember? And he was doing it for himself, and the people got with it, with him doing it. But he didn't start out trying to instruct them and everything to goddamn do, and it wasn't so just hot doggy do you know what i'm saying am i it, it, relating this correctly he must be selling merch people seem to pop for him but to me i agree with you also i'm sick of yeet it's overdone now it's just stupid i i to be honest i think yeet is what's floating him because i don't the work is not there and the promo is not there he's got the word and the catchphrase and the thing he can put on his shirts and his glasses but if they get tired of that and they get tired of him acting like his shit don't stink, it's going to backfire on him. I'll disagree with you on one thing. I think he does have the promo. And, but it's... And, it's when not, he was... Well, go, when he was promoing the family, when he was telling the story, when he's promoing his brother, but when he's just doing the with the fans, and I'm the Yeet Master, Mr. Yeet Down. It, 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 you know, that's bad. I agree uh, with that. That's yeah, bad. that's what well, I'm just I'm just saying. And then Cody left and saying, until we yeet again. Uh so that was to set up Jay's out there. Now he's got a match with Finn Balor and Finn comes from behind and jumps Jay in the ring and they have a match. And as we've said, we don't really want to see any of the Uso matches. It's about what it always is. And finally, Uso hit him with a spear and a splash off the top and beat him one, two, three. And then we get back into the exciting part because now priest comes out and has a face off with Jay and is holding the belt up. And J.D. and Dom jump Uso from behind and start kicking the shit out of him, and Priest is pissed. They're like, what are you doing? He doesn't join in. So now he's in the ostrich position over here. But then Uso fights back and levels the three heels that were on him and left through the crowd. So, again, they're doing everything for this guy, Jay, to where... Three heels can't stop him or beat him up or whatever. But then the, the next part was, it, it could have been anybody but Jay, but it was the, the story was the shot, the way that they did this. It had a lot of people talking about it on Twitter. It was neat, not yeet, but neat in its own way. When Jay goes up through the crowd, and goes out in the concourse of the arena, there's a camera following him. And, of course, there's fans lined up, and you can tell they've got them kind of lined off because they got their security there. But they prep the shot, but it's a continuous shot. Jay goes past the fans, and he's yeeting them, and he goes past concessions and down a hall and walks outside of the arena 
and sees Sammy standing there staring up in the air, looking at the arena. And they start talking, and this is all still a shot. And Sammy says, the first wrestling card I ever saw was in this arena 25 years ago, and now I'm walking in the same way through the front door. And that's what he does. He leaves Jay, same continuous shot, continuous live shot, and he comes in the same way Jay just left. And he's firing the fans up. And when he gets to the the open area, the, the vomitorium, I believe, is the official term when you're the place where you leave an arena or enter the main part of the arena. And he goes in there, you see the crowd instantly in the arena appears and everybody's fucking cheering and going batshit. This was some Orson Welles touch of evil camera work shit. Is there at least, it's, it's, you don't even know to look for it until it starts. And then you're like, wow, that was fucking cool. They spent some time blocking that and working it out. And by the way, what did, I'll let you make your comment, but I'll ask you this. What did Sami Zayn do right before he left the crowd of people that greeted him and went down the stairs to go to the ring? He uh, went into the restroom and took a piss. No, he grabbed a Canadian flag to use as a cape and draped it around himself, risking forevermore that his best bosom buddy, Kevin Steen, would say, oh, that's so corny, the Canadian flag. Dip shit. Anyway, what'd you think of this all the way through the sea of people? They have done some stuff production-wise recently. Single shot stuff that has been incredible. This was great. Sammy going through the hallway, pumping up the fans and them screaming, realizing what's happening, was really cool. Everything that's happened over the past couple months, but really it seems like the talk and how, mu how noticeable it is has been amped up over the last month or so. It's the best the show has ever looked. And there's little things they're introducing, just the way they're producing the interviewers the way they're doing some of this backstage stuff or this big entrance. They don't have the big Tron for every show. I love what they're doing production-wise right now. They don't need to cover up all those empty seats anymore. And that's helped out the, the atmosphere in the arena because it, it looks more like a wrestling show again with people everywhere. And I've always said they got a network-quality television production facility up there in Stanford, but now I'm seeing that Network has made uh, 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 leaps and bounds of improvements and changes. And they've finally caught up with them. So anyway, it's time for our main event in Montreal, Sammy's hometown, Sammy Zayn intercontinental title match against Chad Gable that trained him and motivated him and gave him the, the will to do this. And even after that shot and all this setup and the big intros and everything, they still went a minute to the break. I'm like, God damn. When you want to see the, when you don't want to see the matches, you want breaks so you can zip through them. But when you want to see the matches, it's frustrating. But they started out nice wrestling, fast spots. They're pushing Gable strongly again as a former Olympian instead of shoosh boy. And I'm, I'm pretty sure this Alpha Academy will either go away or undergo a massive overhaul. It, eh. Can we assume that it was just Vince all along that was preventing us from seeing Gable as a talent and, and he was being presented as a joke? Hunter I guess it has to be. Triple H never presented him as a joke. Remember in NXT, he was with American Alpha and they were part of the... That's how we discovered FTR, the revival, yeah. was having those great matches. He came up, he became Shorty G. Then he became the shush guy. You realize as he's presented seriously, and I love the stuff they did with him and Gunther, he's not just really good, but if you present them seriously, there's an opportunity there to do something with him. Yeah, and I think they may be going to capitalize on it. And he not only can work, he can do the moves, but he's getting it. He's getting the, the fucking... I hesitate to use the word psychology anymore. It's overused so much, but he's getting the psychology of the business and how to do this. Anyway, they had a nice match. They, again, they took another break in it. I wrote nice match if I could see it. 
but the way that they did set up, Gable did not heal per se when he was in control. It's because he was working legally on the leg, the knee that Sammy had slipped on the ropes and hurt, blah, blah, blah. So it's not like he's gouging eyes or kicking balls or whatever. And they had some, the only part of this match I didn't agree with when they did the German exchange. Gunther, Gunther, Gable, Gunther Gable Williams, Gable hit the angle slam off the top rope on Sammy. Boom, and then he gives him two German suplexes. But then Sammy does a standing switch and gives Gable two German suplexes. Then <laughs> Gable switches, gives Sammy one. Then Sammy gives Gable one. I'm like, fuck, please leave the German suplex alive. Don't kill the whole goddamn thing in one match. And otherwise, and then Sammy gave Gable the last one on his head. But besides that, they had a good match. Sammy can sell. Gunther was very talented. He can work. And they ended up really having nice sequences at the end. And then finally, Gable did the moonsault, but Sammy put his foot up. But then Gable grabbed the foot and got an ankle lock and cranked it for a long time. And then suddenly, Sammy did a roll up, got a two count, suplexed Gable into the buckle, hit his kick, and covered him one, two, three. Got a big pop. Sammy in his hometown. And after the big celebration, then Sammy was laying, laid the belt out, and Gable's in the corner. And he's clearly upset and near tears. And Sammy lays the belt out and shows him and helps him up. And Gable kind of you know, reluctantly raises Sammy's hand like, ah, he's the better man, and he leaves. And Sammy rolls out and goes to hug his family. And that's when Gable comes back and grabs him and gives him a German suplex on the floor. And the people actually booed. Because it was like, okay, they, they built this. There's some emotional connection between these people. They went through this whole thing, and now Gable stabbed him in the back. And Gable posted him and threw him over the desk and posted him again and got the ankle lock on him around the turnbuckle. And you know, they're going to finally make him serious, hopefully, to you. Even though he's small, he's got all that talent. He can talk and work, and you can get something out of it. And that's why I was screaming about Shoosh Boy all that time. They should have known that they were going to do this eventually. And it would have taken better and quicker without the previous caca that people have to forget. That's why I never want to... If you, if you can't use a guy in a positive position, fire him! Don't fucking just use him like a goddamn dipshit till everybody's sick of seeing him because then you've ruined the rest of his career and you've devalued somebody you're paying. If you can't fucking use him in a positive fashion or if he's not just there to get other people over, fire his ass and bring him back when you got room for him. But anyway, hopefully they're kicking our, our boy Gable into high gear here. Well, let's see. If you want to get him away from the whole shush thing, a heel turn is the move to make. It's not just keep him a baby face and make him more serious. It's a complete break. Yeah. And I'm excited to see where they go with this. And Gunther hasn't been around since he lost the belt. So let's see where, I guess maybe they're holding him off till the draft now that I think about it. Well, yeah, because you never know when he, he could have to report to the selective service any day now. Well, that was WWE Raw live from Montreal. Jim, perhaps you listen to this show today and you think those two are half-assing it. You may want to sue. Well, I'll tell you what. I have heard this man in action. I have heard this man tear into the jugular veins of his opponent in an open courtroom in the pursuit of justice, and you don't want to be on the other side of this man when he starts asking you about how much you got and where you've stashed it. And that's the man, the myth, and the legend, this man. Call Steven. Much 
show or two. Skills of the rest. Yes, folks, if you have been harassed or wrongfully terminated or assaulted by people's negligence or assholery or illegality, the man to turn to, Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 877-50-STEVE. And I'll tell you what, when he's staring at somebody in the courtroom, he's going to find out what they got, where they put it, and how quick he can get a hold of it to get you paid and make you whole again. Stephen P. News' motto in court is, I know who you are, and I saw what you did, and I know what you did with the evidence. You can't and drive away. You can't drive away in your Tesla or in your G-Wagon or whatever it may be. He will get you. You cannot drive away in any of those vehicles without them being impounded and possibly sold to pay your creditors. But nevertheless, from California to Maine to Spain on a choo-choo train, Stephen P. New, newlawoffice.com, 877-50-STEVE. He's going to go and he's going to claw back what has been taken from you. That's the royal you, of course. The royal you. You as in a complete group of you. Not me. Rather than you, the individual you. Yeah, leave me alone. But he'll, he'll be clawing some of your shit, too. The metaphorical you, not me. Claw, clawing it back. No, your actual shit. He'll get some of your me? shit back, too. For, yeah. for what? What did I some do? Some of my shit back, too. He's going to get some of everybody's shit back for him. You're saying he's like Robin Hood. He, he robs Peter to pay Paul. Or he, no, that's not what Robin Hood no, did. That's not Robin he, Hood did something else. He made Mary. He, if he was the king of the forest, that's what Robin Hood did. If he was the king of the forest, Sherwood Forest. <laughs> not Prince, not Duke, not Earl, but Stephen. Sherwood Schwartz. Sherwood Schwartz there. Who had who started that forest and <laughs> instituted a a conservation campaign that exists to this day in many South Sea islands? Stephen P. New. That's him. Not Sherwood Schwartz, but Stephen P. New. Stephen P. New eight seven seven five zero Steve. Do you think that Sherwood had a number eight seven seven five zero Sherwood? I don't think so. I'm not sure if eight seven seven was around yet. Uh, well, no, no, 877, along with all the other numbers, has been around for a couple thousand years now. Well, How do you think they were able to number the year <laughs> B.C.? I, you are indeed correct. Numbers Here, have been around you, though, for a long time. In the, in the year 1100, <laughs> listen to me. Listen to me. I'm trying to talk sense to you. In the year 1100 B.C., what year did they call it? Know. Because think about this. If it was the 1100 BC is before the birth of Christ, right? Before Christ, 1100 BC. That's the line of demarcation. Well, how did they know that anybody was going to be born 1100 years from now? So what year was it to them then there? See? Well, Jim, we will return with these kind of answers, but a few more things before we get out of here. I don't want to run too long, but we have some audio that some listeners have been sending in and uh, another thing that we have here listeners want to get your reaction to this the Meltzer says what twitter account just tweeted out dave did the brian voice again while they argued over crowd heat in the uh, diana versus mariah may match how could they argue over something that didn't exist i'm not sure let's hear what this is i'm hearing it we're going to review it right now for the first time here this was been sent in by a bunch of the listeners posted by Meltzer said what we had Diana and Mariah May, and uh, inexplicably, Diana is still a baby face. So she's out there making her comeback, and no one cares. Tries Brian, to... what? There was there was a what? lot of heat in this match for Diana's what? comeback. The no, match... there was not. Well, if they didn't do a comeback, they did back and forth, and there was heat no. On the they back got and forth. they got heat on Diana, and she starts making a comeback, and they did not care. They went at back the end and when forth. they started going back and forth. When they, they got cared. back and forth. I thought they were joking. They're serious, I guess. They're seriously mad about a comeback in a girls' match. When they got went back and forth, the crowd was real into this Yeah, because they were into Mariah. They were into both. <laughs> when they went back and forth, they popped for both <laughs> one's offenses. This one, I, Brian, they were into this no, match. No, I watched this match. I was like, we're doing this again? Deanna's making a comeback, and it's quiet. They went. I was watching it. I'll no, load it up know. right now if I have to. Load it up. 
Let me stop it for Wait a second. Wait a minute. If I tell you a rooster can pull a boxcar, hook it up, motherfucker. What in the world are they? He can't even admit that the girls' matches on his favorite Vanity Project television program don't have any heat to them? It's astounding the lengths that Dave will go to to not say anything negative about AEW while he claims that he's critiquing them the same way he critiques everything else. It's obvious that he isn't. Those weren't crickets. Those were people with wooden fingers clapping. I want to remind everyone, the show you're listening to right now and the Jim Cornette Experience are free shows. People pay for this. <laughs> for these two guys. We're reviewing well, I don't it. Know. I'm, I'm kind of entertained hearing them argue with each other. Well, let's, uh, let's let them load it up. Let's go back to it. Load it up. The crowd was into the match. They were not into it at the beginning. They were into it at the end. I can't complain. I can't say one negative thing about this match. I didn't say was, anything negative about it. It was a good match, and the crowd was into it. What more do you want? Mariah slipped out, hit a kick, running hip attack. Ha! Well, that's it right there, but that's the problem. If Tony's Ryan. listening to Dave, if Tony's listening to Dave, and Dave is pretending that the problems aren't there, the things you aren't hearing... You're not hearing. I, I, usually it's, you're not hearing the things you heard. You're not hearing the things you're not hearing. When it comes to the AEW crowd reaction, what are your thoughts on these two going at it again? Well, I think that uh, poor Uncle Dave, his tongue lopped over his eye teeth and he couldn't see what he was saying. That's what his problem was. I would think at some point, if you and I just couldn't agree on just minor relatively simple shit and started arguing about that wouldn't we find somebody else to do the fucking program with because they're they're starting to be on two different pages here aren't they alvarez is at least apparently open to the prospect that people might be able to see with their own fucking eyes and mentions things they might have seen and and uncle dave is still like, oh no everything's fine that was that was merely a, a fucking ice cube that the titanic just hit and that's part of the problem because some of the influential voices for Tony Khan are not really, they're either not seeing it or they're not being honest about things that are happening in AEW on these shows specifically and on Dynamite specifically. It, it's not easy to tell a Vince McMahon, and believe me, I've tried, to tell a Vince McMahon that his idea isn't good or that you really don't think that people are going to like that particular thing that you just said or whatever. It's not easy to do, but. It ought to be. Tony is not nearly as as intimidating a presence as Vince McMahon, at least used to be back in the day. One would think that people could come to him and say, "Tony, I've been doing this for fifteen years. Trust me, this is a shit. You don't need to do that." But he only wants to hear the people as, "Oh, this is great. We've been waiting for a wrestling company like this to constrict in size until it fucking." falls into under its own weight like a fucking dark star. Can you imagine defending any of those women division matches and the crowd reaction to them? That's insane. No, I can defend the crowd's reaction to those matches. I'd have had the same one. Well, Jim, one last thing before we get out of here. We have some audio. As we are recording, this has uh, just taken place. Tony Khan did a media call for AEW Dynasty. It's the big AEW Joan Collins crossover. Here's Tony answering a question, apparently, I'm reading this now, about the fan feedback to airing the CM Punk Jack Perry backstage footage. Oh, boy. After the ratings came in, uh, felt like when the TBS called me and told me, good job, you have to remember that I'm responsible for everybody's jobs in this company. And it is really important for us to please the network and TBS was really happy with that show and that performance. That's the most important thing. And okay, hold, on, hold on one second. Hold on one second. First of all, just real briefly, TBS wouldn't know shit from apple butter about why that they aired the footage, what the footage was about or what do they care about backstage skirmishes? They probably didn't know they're looking at the number. But what Tony is trying to say to us there is that TBS called him up and said, oh, you did great. You're back to where you were three weeks ago. 
Because that's what they did. They dropped a couple weeks, and then with that footage, they got back up even to where they were the three weeks before, right? It, it's, and by the way, is that the argument now that he aired it just to make TBS happy? Well, I guess because that, you know, the other ones didn't fly, so why not come up with that one? But no, it wouldn't make TBS happy one way or the other what they air as long as the number is there. And the number was what the fucking show had been doing three weeks before that. It wasn't like they suddenly brought The Rock in and or CM Punk and the quarter jumped 500,000 viewers. Like on the other program, they got back to the level they were at three weeks ago. And people made fun of them in the process like never before. It, it, it. Ay, ay, ay. Well, there's not too much more here, I don't believe. Let's go back to Tony. And feedback on the show that we got. Uh, you know, the rating is the number one source of fan feedback in the end, the network, and they were incredibly pleased. It was over 400,000 viewers in the 18 to 49 demographic, and that was a strong performance. And that is how TBS judges the show. And then just start airing security camera footage everywhere you can. Well, no, just go ahead and air Punk's greatest hits because that's where he's strongest, the 18 to 49, right? And that's why extra people tuned in to see Punk on the show. So just every week air another CM Punk match that you have in your archive as a rerun, and it will do better viewers than the new stuff with your other fucking weasels. And how TBS judges the show is the most important metric I have for the performance. Uh, And then... The fan reception last night, we had an amazing crowd. The fans were rabid. They were really excited. They were red hot in particular for that match involving the Young Bucks. FTR got big chance. And I think what people were really excited. What the fuck was he watching? See... <laughs> there was 2,500 people in a 90 year old ABA arena standing there staring <laughs> while the fucking Buckaroos and O'Cody fucking beat up three people. It's a. F- they were rabid. Foaming at the mouth. <laughs> Foaming at the mouth, even. Yes, probably because they got goddamn some type of disease from Moxley, who was out first. He's Young contagious. Buck teaming up this weekend with Okada to take on Pac and FTR and get a preview of that big ladder match at Dynasty. I'm very much excited about it. I do think that what we did last week added a lot of intrigue to this match, and I'm very excited for the Dynasty pay-per-view. I think it's going to be a great pay-per-view, and I am very happy about how we got here. How did that security camera footage add any intrigue whatsoever to the tag team match coming up between the Buckaroos and FTR? The st- they couldn't even come up with a good story. We couldn't pray. They ca- They have to be disingenuous fake heels even when we couldn't pray before our match because we were so distracted by this guy shoving this other guy and, and somebody getting face locked that we were done for the rest of the night what i've been in fucking car wrecks and gone and hosted raw live for two fucking hours I, do, I what the, How is that tied in the bigger problem is that tony can never admit a mistake now again this is a fresh mistake this is last week the fan feedback was pretty universal. Everyone thought it was a bad idea. He's now saying the only thing that matters are the ratings. And not only the ratings, but if TBS is happy with the ratings. The barometer keeps moving for judging what's good and what isn't. And he can't, he just can't say, I made a mistake. Or it's a bad idea. He thinks it built up interest in the Bucks FTR match. Does anyone care about that match because of that? footage nobody did it make anyone care more about the match no one was demanding at all no you know i I always go back to this tony wants to go out there and say other people have bad faith arguments tony never talks to the wrestling media or anyone in good faith it's always bullshit well because he wants the whole company to be built specifically for smart fans and then when he does media he tries to talk to him in kayfabe uh, but and again, I'll just say this: If you announced, ladies and gentlemen, we have just uncovered home movies of Marilyn Monroe in 1958 having sexual relations with a goddamn Doberman Pinscher, 
And we're going to show it Thursday night at 9 o'clock out of the family hour on network TV for the very first time. You'd get a fucking number, wouldn't you? But would there really be any reason to show that footage other than to get the fucking number? It would to really embarrass tie... CM Punk, to try and embarrass Well, wait a minute. Why would CM, CM Punk. Punk be embarrassed? Because Marilyn Monroe had sexual relations oh, with a oh. different <laughs> picture. <laughs> I thought you were talking about Tony's reasoning, not the Marilyn Monroe sex No, video no, we're, we're still on Marilyn with... and the Doberman. There's only one reason to show it, because people will watch it. So you just admit, I'll show anything. I'll show bestiality. I'll show fucking snuff films, whatever. As long as people watch, doesn't have to be good. Doesn't have to make any sense or apply to what's going on in the overall scheme of things. But, but I'll tell you what, that Doberman. Well, that Doberman, that, that little pinch right there was the end of this episode. <laughs> Where's my, uh, here we and go. And possibly the series. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have it in me. Today. Yeah, I just don't have it. I've lost the touch. This isn't even on. It's not even a sound I want. I give up. Listen, we'll be back on the Jim Cornette experience in a few days. Everyone's doing stupid stuff. This is gonna be so much fun stuff to listen to on the Jim Cornette experience. And of course, right back here in the drive-through, big AEW. Not Revolution, Dynasty. It's the beginning of their new dynasty in St. Louis. Or they may just die nasty. We'll find out. And we'll talk about it on The Experience. Follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. Follow me at Great Brian Last. 605 Super Podcast. Of course, The Wrestling News, wherever you find your favorite podcast, and uh, at thewrestlingnews.com. And Super Podcast for all Arcadian Vanguard shows. Jim Cornette's Collectibles at Jim Cornette. Dot com. What's going on, Jim? Yeah, but Jim dot com. I'm out of it. Oh, well, I wish you'd stay out of it. Uh, just leave the thing to me. It's a safe shot every time. Jim dot com. Midnight Express action figures, heavily bodies action figures, Jim Cornette action figures, and so much more, including T-shirts, certificates, photos, DVDs, books, and coming soon funnels. All right. At Jim dot com. And of course, when that funnel malfunctions, you may want to sue. The Law Office of Stephen P. New, 877-50-STEVE. 877-50-STEVE. This man tears it up in a courtroom. I'm telling you from first-hand experience, you don't want to piss him off and you want him on your side. The Law Office of Stephen P. New, newlawoffice.com. That's it. More on the experience, more laughs, more love, more deep thoughts. For Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tell you! Oh!